start the program by giving you a quick uh, view on the global markets. So uh, I'd like to show you guys uh, just a bit of perspective. Now this map shows you real GDP growth of the world and the stark difference between Asia and the traditional sources of growth, which is the developed markets. As you can see here in this chart, the greener the color, the higher the growth. And growth is indeed concentrated in Asia. More specifically, our part of Asia. The Philippines, China, and India will be growing between 6 and 10%. While the rest of the Asian periphery, you have Thailand, Indonesia, and Malaysia, will be growing around 3 to 6%. And the fact is, this area is expected to stay green for as long as the World Bank and IMF care to make forecasts, right? Our foreign market experts call it the Asian century, okay? With ASEAN 5 and the Philippines included, we will continue to dictate a larger portion of growth moving forward. To further appreciate, I'd like to show you a chart of GDP. Real GDP growth as forecasted from 2018 all the way to 2023. And emerging and developing Asia will be growing faster than the world. It will be growing fat, twice as fast as developing economies and growing even more aggressive than the rest of the emerging markets, namely Latin America and Africa. And our specific region, ASEAN 5, where we belong, will be growing between 55 to 6% over the next five years. Inflation, which oftentimes is referred to as the undesirable consequence of growth, right? as we grow, people tend to bid up prices, will remain to be manageable, at least in our part of the world. Like most of you, I hope going through these slides will help support the thesis that growth is really here. And growth is going to stay here for the foreseeable future. But I'm almost certain that all of you are wondering if the growth is that high, then what happened from 9,000 to even before the actual recovery started to take hold, we lost around 22% in the market, right? And the answer is very simple. It's about net foreign outflows. Here's an estimate of the outflows from 2010 until uh, I think the end, the fourth quarter of 2017. This is an estimate by the IMF of the total inflows we've had in emerging markets. You can see there the whopping 366 billion US dollars worth of volumes that flowed into our market. And majority of this is from the expansion of the balance sheet of the Fed, meaning as they eased their markets, money flowed into emerging markets, including us. Again, if growth is going to stay here in Asia, then why are they coming back? And the answer is also quite simple, because the US is growing faster for longer. The chart on the left shows you that the average U.S. economic expansion is only at 60 months. Now it's at 83 months and counting. Thanks, of course, to the aggressive policies of Mr. Trump in uh, boosting their uh, economic output through tax reform. And it's really not hard to imagine when equity investors that used to be in Asia is now considering coming back to the U.S. Okay na economy eh. So I guess I'll go back there. The chart to the right shows you that the U.S. unemployment rate in blue, there, and the Fed funds rate in orange. The unemployment rate in the U.S. is now at its lowest level, uh, at least at, uh, as far as this chart is concerned. And they are trying to normalize the rates so they will have another tool to address another crisis, another slowdown or recession. So U.S. is going to increase the rates in the foreseeable future. To make matters worse, the rate normalization of the Fed cannot easily be matched by the central banks of the world, including ours. Because again, iba-iba ho tayo ng growth paths. Iba-iba ng policy recommendations on central banks. So this, this synchrony will uh, again create the flows that we've seen. And this slide shows you the estimate of the IMF, at least for emerging markets. Of the, of the expected outflows in emerging markets, mainly caused by the, by the adjustments in policies by the Fed. And until this forecast is uh, completed in 2019, it's almost a fifth of total outflows. 
So that's the environment that we're going to live from now moving forward. Time and again, this is another example, ladies and gentlemen, of an external factor affecting our, our local markets. And we hope that the discussions today will allow us to first look at the data. Let's not be carried away with emotions. And using history as our best guide in order for us to make the appropriate strategy moving forward. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let me introduce our distinguished panel for today. First, we have our Vice President and Chief Equity Strategist, Ms. April Tan. <clears throat> and we'll also be joined by our Chief Technical Analyst, Mr. Juanes Barredo. So, let's first talk about what happened. So, I guess I have a question for you, April. Ano? So the last time we were, we had an outlook, the market was indeed above, or almost breaching the 9,000 level. But when the market corrected back at least uh, around a month ago, close to the 6,900 level, what happened, April? Hello. Okay, so for the year-to-date period, um, I think we're 11% down. But from the peak, we're down 16%. And I think at one point in time, um, you know, we were at the bear market territory. People were wondering whether we would actually have a bear market. And to a certain extent, we weren't really surprised. Because when we did our market outlook briefing earlier this year, we talked about the risks. And one of the risks that we highlighted was um, higher than expected inflation. Um, due to the implementation of the tax reform program. And of course, you're implementing it at a time when your economic growth is very strong. And secondly, oil prices globally were very high. So as you can see, um, our inflation rate has gone up quite a bit um, at 5.3% for the headline inflation. And core inflation, which is actually um, inflation excluding the volatile prices of oil and food products like rice, still up by 4.3%. So it just goes to show you that inflation um, really is a problem. And I think another problem is that when we were at 9,100, um, a lot of stocks were trading at lofty valuations, or fair, I would say, because for example, when we started the year, we were saying our target for the PACI was 9,300 and the PSEI was at 9.1. So it only leaves you with a lit little upside for a lot of stocks. So of course, when the negative surprise came in, then you had share prices going down. But aside from that, we had other factors that came about that we weren't expecting, but were equally bad, you know. Um, when inflation first disappointed or surprised people, the BSP did not move right away. It, it took them a bit of time because they're saying this is a one-time thing because of the tax reform. So, you know, let's wait until we see the second round effects. So it took them a while before they raised interest rates. And emerging market equities became out of favor. Um, later, we'll talk about this in more detail because it's a long Okay. And uh, I, I guess I, I, I just have a quick follow-up, April, no? With regard to, uh, with regard to, to uh, your core and headline inflation, the bang basic difference in the I mean, for people who are not. Okay, so, on. so as I've said before, the core inflation um, excludes um, the impact of oil and um, rice. Because um, one of the things you can say is the reason why inflation is high is because oil prices are high. So, yung Core inflation, if I were, for example, the central bank and I look at it, it's more representative of whether there really is pressure in the economy. And, um, you know, ano ba itong second round effect na pinag-uusapan nila? Kasi kung ako si BSP and I look at inflation, it's not conclusive that there is the second round effect. When I say second round effect, for example, um, you as a businessman, you're encountered with higher costs. If you feel like the market is very strong and your customers can actually afford to pay more, papas on yung higher cost. 
in fact, think about it. Um, the, ako, diba, sabi ko, every week I buy my Gatorade and what have you. So, I used to pay 19.50 per bottle of Gatorade. Okay? Because of the excise tax on sugary drinks, supposed to be, um, it's an additional 6 peso per liter. And one bottle of Gatorade is, diba, 19. So, 500 ml, so dapat plus 3, dapat maging 23, 24. But instead of increasing price by only 3 pesos to do a full pass on lang of the excise tax, what the what these companies did was they doubled the price to 40, 50 pesos. So isn't that reflective na feeling nila, eh kaya naman ng market i-absorb yun eh, di pass on namin lahat, dagdagan pa namin kasi... Since mababawasan ng volume, we want our margins to go up. So, you know, that's just how it is. People feel like, well, the demand is strong, so we can pass on the higher price. Kaya pag nabasa niyo yung, di ba si um, DOF, they, talk, they consider this to be profiteering, sabi nila. Yeah, yan yung sinasabi lang profiteering. That's the second round effect. Because people will always say, oh, we're increasing prices because of tax reform. Pero sa totoo, hindi yun. Hindi totoo yun. They're just using it as an excuse to increase prices of everything. So that's the second round effect that we're talking about, that we're seeing today. And, and you know, the market doesn't like it um, because, of course, it means higher interest rates. I think Juanes will talk about it later. Um, yeah, and going pala, going back to emerging markets since the slide is there, you will notice that um, the movement of the Philippines is same as the emerging markets. But of course, we have underperformed. I think the, a certain part of our weakness is due to our inflation problem, but not 100%. Another part is also due to the underperformance of emerging markets or them being out of favor. Again, uh, thanks, Abel. So moving over to Anis. Again, sir, nice to have you back. Um, oh, what? Um, how did the market fare, sir? based on your technical perspective. All right, so I think the first half of the year was really quite a bit of a, uh, a heavy set correction that we saw. In fact, uh, although I was anticipating a correction to come, it came at a form that was a bit more severe than what I initially expected. And um, the, the corrections that we've seen took place quite a bit across the world, but uh, it really impacted quite heavily into the Philippines. And the PSEI, as a result, did fall down to that 716,900 zone. And uh, as April uh, did point out, it was really cost primarily because uh, there were certain things that came inside that was unanticipated, at least in the size. Uh, inflation went up too fast. Uh, rates to try to adjust to that inflation came in too slow. And that's why there was an accelerated move to do it. So I, how many rates did they have to? in a span of less than, what, four months, right? Uh, and, and that's quite of a shocker because normally people tend, even on an aggressive campaign, one 25 basis point rise per quarter is normal. All of a sudden you're getting slamming two and you don't know if there's gonna be another two and more likely possible maybe, we don't know, depending on how inflation looks. And uh, as a result, the market decided to pull back in defense right away. And it didn't even want to rally. Normally, the rallies from a sharp sell-off are usually, usually big. In this case, the rally was actually very blunt, as I'll show you in a little while. So the, um, the index right now, at least since we've seen in the last few days, has managed to make a recovery. But it took a while before that came in. Most of the recoveries we've seen have been very slight. But this is the first wider recovery we've had in a long time, but I guess primarily because valuations came to a relatively decent area. And so I think what's going to happen is your market will rally to resistance first, uh, come back after that, and then prepare a base building effect coming from that particular portion. So in the perspective what you see here, so you have the Philippines on the left, uh, you have the U.S. market in the center, and you have the emerging markets index on the right side. Uh, you can see that the U.S. was quite resilient. It didn't really back off like the way the Philippine market did back off. But all three of them backed off to their next support levels, particularly the Philippines into a major support level. And that could also be contributing to affect why the Philippines is, is generating some lift today. Um, I'm still a little worried about the U.S. I mean, as I were, was in the beginning of the year, 
primarily because we're testing previous highs. Uh, we've also came out with not so good earnings with some tech stocks that's uh, beaten up a few tech issues in the last couple of days. And I think that we might feel some pressure also coming. And I'll talk about also that later on. But I think we have one more. So just to give you a sense of what happened, uh, so this has been the performance of the market from the uh, beginning of the year up to what we've seen where the Philippine index hit a low, where we went below the 20% zone, as you can see there. Uh, the red bar shows you the Philippine decline that went to about, uh, uh, close to about, what is that, 27, I think, or 22%, something in that area. Uh, the only two countries that came close to us was Hong Kong and China. Hong Kong did about 17% 17, 17 at the worst. China also went to about 20% at the worst end of it. The rest did not go down as deep as the way we are. So really the impact was on our side, right? And so clearly something changed over here. And I guess maybe April can give you a sense of that and how that had taken place. Is there one more there? Yeah, okay. So our result, the Philippine index did back off all the way to that low closer to um, uh, the area of 6,900 so, but then it managed to be able to make a recovery. What was nice though is that it did break out of the downtrend line. Although that is a positive sign, uh, later I will explain to you that despite that, this bottoming process takes time, right? So I know you might be getting excited. Wow, we broke out of this, that's it. All worst is over. Yes, possibly, but it doesn't mean that good times are back, all right? So what's going to happen is you have to be prepared for what this thing is going to bring on. Although we've had a nice signal here, it takes time to turn the trend around. And we'll explain to you how we're going to handle that later. All right. Thank you, Juanes. So I guess uh, uh, just to uh, reiterate what, what you've mentioned, April and Juanes, no? so I guess the correction mainly was exacerbated by the fact that uh, we had that, uh, those uh, uh, rate increases by the BSP in an environment where they all were, they all were telling us that it's not something that we should worry about, right? But they're surprised that the, it's actually a bit high. And now before I move on to the next part of the presentation, I think we have a question from our, one of our participants in Slido. So can you flash it, please? Ayun. So question. Thank you for the question. Ano? So what would the index uh, price ring, uh, what should the index price range of the Philippine index, should we enter after the correction of the market? Should we uh, wait for a higher low? I guess this um, question should be answered a bit later. Or do you care to uh, just I'll, give a teaser? I'll answer you a yes first now, and I'll give you the detail later. <laughs> but uh, yes, it takes time, like I said. So we, those are one of the things we want to see a higher low in the index. All right, so thanks for asking. Keep those questions flowing. Again, if you have any questions, just so put it there, and then you can also vote for the questions that you like. I, another question. Uh, I, where, where is inflation going with Train 2 and uh, the 2019 midterm elections, at least for us? From okay, Mr. That's, a, that's actually a difficult question, but, um, <laughs> well, the good news is, you know, next year, the size of the taxes, the excise taxes that will be imposed is much less mm -hmm. compared to this year. And remember, uh, the BSP has already raised rates two times. Next year, they're gonna raise it by another, or, or later this year, they're gonna raise it a little bit more. They were messaging it already, and they said, we're not gonna cut reserve requirements first, so they're going to be more aggressive in controlling inflation. So next year, they're anticipating inflation to go down. Um, we think it is uh, strong. There is a strong possibility that it will be lower next year compared to this year. But I think people are waiting for the headline numbers to actually go down before becoming more optimistic. I, we'll talk about it later. So, all right, so I think that's all we have for the questions. So moving on to our next section, I'd like to share with uh, our, our um, panel here about a question that uh, we asked you guys when you registered for the event. And we asked you what factors would affect the market for the next 12 months. And 28% uh, of you guys answered foreign fund flows. Next being economic growth at 26%. Then 
14% of you are worried about the escalation of, of the trade war. 13% are concerned about the performance of global markets, while only 11% are worried about inflation, while a smaller 9% are worried about the weakening peso. So I'd like to ask uh, April once again, since the top uh, answer there are fund flows, um, what do you think about this, April? What, uh, what do you think is causing this problem? It is just for everyone's yeah, information. Okay. So I think definitely fund flows um, are an issue. As you've seen, I mean, initially when, I mean, I was looking at this a few months ago. I was quite surprised to, to see that we only had positive net inflows in January. And that was it. I mean, initially I wanted to show a weekly breakdown, but it's just too much. So we accumulated everything. Pero consistent talaga every week. Net selling, net selling, net selling. And this is um, taking into consideration that we didn't have any net inflows actually since 2013, 2014. I think this this is the funds that came in in 08, 09, you know, when the market started to recover. So really, I mean, we, we saw a lot of that. So in a way, we were quite surprised about it. Um, so there are many factors causing it. I think one of the reasons is you know, you have the strong U.S. dollar. Um, and the reason, one of the reasons why we're seeing a strong U.S. dollar is because the Fed is increasing rates faster than most central banks. Okay, and in June 13 this year, they showed that um, they, they had a, the, but they have this Fed meeting every so often. So they had the Fed meeting in June. And then the 15 members were asked about their opinion on where do you think the Fed fund rate will be by end of the year. And based on the outcome of that survey, it implied that they will be increasing it another two times until the end of the year. And people, people were anticipating one more. So that was a faster than expected increase in, um, ano, uh, in interest rates. And because of that, that caused the US dollar to strengthen even further. Um, so, you know, the peso is weak, yes, but it's not 100% our fault. It's also partly because we're seeing a strong U.S. dollar, okay? And, um, you know, the, the relationship of the emerging markets and the U.S. dollar is inverse, as you can see here. Every time the U.S. dollar weakens, emerging markets go up. Every time the U.S. dollar strengthens, emerging markets go down. So there is an inverse relationship between the two. Okay, and aside from that, um, you know, we, you know, we now talk about, I think if you look at the international papers, you know, Trump is always in the headline talking about all these trade wars. And I kind of realize it's not only a U.S.-China trade war, it's U.S. against like everybody in the world, you know. Um, and you know, emerging markets, but the, the major target for the trade war really is China. And if you look at the emerging markets, China accounts for a big chunk of the emerging market index at 33%. And you have other highly export-dependent countries like um, Taiwan, South Korea, which are also heavily exporting to China, which is why, you know, I mean, we're, we're part of this index, but we're part of the others. You know, I mean, if I were a foreign investor and you know, I'm just concerned about emerging markets being affected by the trade war. I just sell everything without taking into consideration whether the Philippines is um, a beneficiary of this trade war or not. Um, you know, um, we don't think that we are going to be hurt by it, but at the same time, you know, the foreign investors, they, they kind of don't care. They're looking at it from a big picture perspective and they're just focusing on the fact that China accounts for a big chunk of um, the emerging markets index. Parang nasasama lang tayo sa benta nila <laughs> of emerging markets. Kasama talaga. All right. Um, moving on, let's uh, ask Juanes about uh, what are your views on the, uh, on the U.S. markets, the yields, and the, st and the strength of the U.S. dollar, since April has talked about it also. Okay. Well, the... S&P 500, uh, I'll use this rather than the Dow because clearly this, this particular index measures a bigger basket of uh, more essential stocks. And you can see the picture there is showing you a, a worked up uh, recovery in a channel 
the only thing I'm going to feel apprehensive about right now is that we're hitting the previous high. And, you know, there's the potential that we hit into this major resistance point that the market might attempt to be able to subside again. So as an external impact to us, um, any pullback from here might cause some volatility back into our market as well. In fact, last night and the day before, we've had bad earnings by tech companies like Facebook and Twitter. Um, when Facebook came out with its earnings, it dropped by 18-19% eight, in a single day, losing $120 billion in value. And last night, Twitter fell down by 20% and it lost $6.6 in, in in value. And, and you get concerned that is, is this setting a trend of tech companies? The Nasdaq was down more than a percent last night also under the same circumstance. So it feels that the, the U.S. may have to come down and that might trigger some influence into our market as well. In terms of the bond yield, uh, the U.S. bond yield, and just to let you know why we watch this, is because the bond yields uh, serve as a precursor or it serves as a, a benchmark to see how interest rates in the U.S. are faring. So if yields like that picture starts going higher, there's an expectation that interest rates will more likely do the same thing. And so we watch this very closely because if this starts running up a bit more aggressively than the way it should, which is more gradual, then that will put more concern that are, do they need to raise rates faster? Or is it going to be more sustainable? Or will it cap itself next year, like what, what we are anticipating, hopefully? But we don't know. We'll, we'll see how it goes. But so far, the graph still shows that it's locked into a consolidation range after pulling back heavily. And as long as it stays between that red and blue line, then we should be OK. There shouldn't be nothing adverse coming into it. But I think April explained earlier on that, remember, it's not as simple as owning the US. It, you're looking at everything happening around the world at the same time. Um, the fear in the last few days is that the Japanese, uh, the Bank of Japan, may start to be able to cut back on all the stimulus efforts they're doing. And if that happens, there might be another push up in rates across the globe. And that's why the bond market in the US sank quite heavily. And that's why that's going up the way you see it right now. So we're going to be watching that carefully into the next few periods. But, this is clear. I hope that it's going to taper. I mean, that's what I want to happen. Because if that happens, it might allow some breathing space for our market. If not, and you better be prepared, there might be some more reactions. Then, and, and to the concern of the dollar, I think you can see right there that the dollar shot up very, very strongly. It's now going sideways. And the band of that sideways move is slowly starting to narrow. As that starts to move and narrow down, it's going to force a decision out of that dollar I'm saying in the next few weeks. So I think in the next two or three weeks, that movement is going to push out of that band. And we've got our fingers crossed that we hope it goes down. Because like April pointed out, if that starts to go up and you have that impact, and you've got some currencies going back into a little bit more of chaos, and people tend to be more defensive when too much volatility into the currency market is, is obviously there. So you're going to have to watch this into the next few couple of weeks. I guess I have a question for you guys. Now, we are look, looking at the 10-year U.S. Treasury, but if you observe the short-term rates, the two-year rates, it's actually moving faster than the 10-year. So is this something that we should also look at? What do you think? Because in terms of, for instance, a risk-off behavior, I think, to me, I'd look at the two-year more. So in flattening of the yes, yield curve. Yes, flattening the yield yeah. curves. Yeah. yeah, I think people are worried about the flattening of the yield curve because historically, um, it has been you know, um, associated with bear markets. Um, not really flattening, but inversion, where the short term is higher than the long. the long term. But there have been several theories as to why this is, and even the economists themselves can't seem to agree as to what is the reason for it. But from a, you know, pragmatic perspective, um, usually rates in the short term go up substantially because there's a bubble and the Fed will try to tighten significantly. No? Whereas, of course, I mean, over the long term, they expect the economy to, say, perform poorly. That's why the short term rates are down. But I mean, now that's not it. People are just saying, Nako, we're worried. It's, it might invert. Diba? So, you know, I don't think it's conclusive at this point, but I think when you read the papers and you know the blogs and and everything everybody will talk about possible yield curve inversion as a concern for them you know 
at this point, nothing to worry about. Again, let's go to the slide to our Slido app to see if we have any questions related to this topic. So, guys, do we have questions? Yon, from Mr. Romulo, trade war between U.S. and China is imminent. How it, how will it affect our financial market, and what are the necessary actions and precautions that we have to take? Okay, so the trade war. Um, again, I think it's well we. You know, I, I write a column pala, sort of plug, no? once a week. <laughs> and that's one of the things I talked about. Um, you know, we're not really an, a very export-dependent country. So um, that said, um, I don't think we're going to be affected much. And think about the targets being, uh, you know, called upon by Trump right now. You have Canada, uh, China, Mexico, Deva Brazil, whatever. You, you know, you can just do a Google search and look at countries with huge um, trade deficits uh, or U.S. trade deficit. Who are the countries which export a lot more to the U.S. versus import? And, you know, yun na. it's China, EU, uh, Canada, and ano, Brazil, Mexico. Not the Philippines, baka nga ano sila, trade surplus pa sila sa atin. So, I don't think we really are, or they will target us. They're, they're going after the big fish. And, you know, that said, we had this interesting meeting last week um, with, the, with the semiconductor company who said that, you know, this is the chance of a lifetime for the Philippines. We're actually very excited. You know, the demand for our services is, you know, beyond expectation. That's what they said. Um, because of the U.S.-China trade war. Siyempre, nung una, medyo nagulat kami. Bakit ganun? Sabi na, well, think about it. Sabi niya, you know, the companies, when, when uh, you know, in the past, they always don't want to go to the Philippines because they talk about our limitations in terms of supply chain, blah, 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 China being more efficient and all of that. But now, they're, they're thinking we need some risk management measures. And, what if the you know the trade war intensifies there? We need to bring out certain volume to Southeast Asia, to countries like Philippines, Thailand, and you know the exports coming out of China on the IT side is super big. That even if we get a small portion of it here, it's a big boost to our manufacturing, and um, our labor costs are not expensive anymore. They're actually very happy that the, pe the peso has depreciated. Um, they said our labor cost is actually cheaper compared to Thailand. Um, and then they said the people here, well, it's more difficult to train um, initially, but they said the, the workers are more loyal and they're younger. So they said that's, a, that's the reason why they're very excited about the Philippines. So, I mean, let's not be too bearish. We could actually benefit from the trade war. Right. In fact, to what you mentioned, uh, I think in terms of the furniture industry, which is part of the list of, of a Mr. Trump of tariffs, uh, Thailand is also, uh, Vietnam rather, was having a good time because now the U.S. is going to source their furniture from Thailand or in the fact that soybean is part of the tariffs imposed by China on the U.S., Brazil soy prices are now really high, right? So I guess, uh, do we have another question? Yes, and one, one more to this topic. What's your outlook on the peso on a technical analysis perspective from Mr. Cruz? I think we have a slide that's going to cover that one. Yeah, we'll talk about right, so we'll just answer that a little bit later. Okay, so moving on, let's, uh, let's move on to the strategy. Given the perspective on the global and local environment, we, again, we've asked our, our, you, our customers, and CEO Premium, about your expectations of the PSEI by the end of 2018. And, uh, well, it's a lot, uh, not a lot, but a bit uh, less uh, bullish than when we started this year. Around 46% are saying that we're going to be neutral, that the market is going to stay within 6,900 to 7,500, while 36% are still weak bulls, expecting the market to, be, to end between 7,500 and 8,300. So, April, let's uh, ask you again, what, are, what do you think are the catalysts that could possibly materialize these levels, meaning the weak or possibly a strong bull, yeah. if possible. So I guess I'll start out by saying that um, our target is 
8-6. So you might say I'm a strong bull, right? 8-6. Okay. But that said, what are the catalysts that will allow it to reach 8,600? Because 8-6 is fair value. Eh? You know, um, we've identified four major catalysts which we think will allow the market eventually to reach that. And these have to materialize in our opinion. Inflation finally peaks. Um, corporate earnings growth beats estimates. Um, the U.S. Fed stops raising rates. And U.S., China corporate earnings or global corporate earnings will remain strong even with the trade war as, you know, you as proof that we shouldn't really be worried about the trade war. But mm -hmm. the bad news is, of course, um, inflation, which we thought would peak in June, actually disappointed and it continues to go up. Um, as you can see, the factors which are pushing up inflation, aside from the tax reform program, would be crude oil price. It's still going up. Rice prices, the bad. That's why, I mean, initially I was wondering why do they even talk about rice in the news, you know? And upon research, um, um, I found out that the rice price in the Philippines is double that of other countries. Mm because the government is controlling the importations. That's why lately they talk about rice tarification, diba? because what they plan to do is they will allow importation of rice that is half the price, and then they will, import, uh, they will impose a 25% tariff. And the tariff that they will get, they will use to subsidize the farmers instead of what they're doing right now, which is supporting prices at a very high price. Mm -hmm. So sabi nila, may import na daw, pero price. This is a mm -hmm. weekly data we get from the PSA, by the way. Right. And of course, um, we have the weak peso. And you go to the next slide. So the weak peso is not good for us because we import a lot of things. So that's inflationary. And finally, I just want to point out that because I think if you remember a month or two ago, the DOF, Central Bank, were talking about Oh, we've seen the worst inflation has peaked. But I think big lang 180 degree turn yan eh. The reason why they changed their mind is if you look at the month on month inflation, you will see that after jumping up to 0.9 and then falling to 0% for the month of May, it picked up again to 0.6% in June. Ibig sabihin lang, yung mga tao na nagdelay ng price increase when June came around, they actually implemented the price increases. And it shows that the economy is strong enough to absorb such price increases. That's why businessmen actually took the opportunity to pass on higher, higher costs to the consumer. So, kaya biglang nagpalit na sila ng tax, and they're saying we're going to be more aggressive in addressing inflation. So, that's a problem. I mean, inflation is taking longer than expected to peak. So, um, it's going to be a problem still. And then this one. Um, well, this is the dot plots that I was talking to you about. Every time the Fed has a meeting, the 15 members will be asked, what do you think interest rates will be um, in 2018, 2019, 2020? So, um, so they're still expecting interest rates to go up two more times in 2018, or another 50 basis points, bringing the total increase for this year to 100 basis points. Come 2019, but it's not going to end this year. Next year, they're going to increase it three more times. Three more times. So, it means being, um, you know, the ending of the Fed rate hike cycle is not expected to be this year. Mga towards the later part of next year. So, that's another catalyst that, you know, it might take long to materialize. And finally, the last two ones, uh, corporate earnings growth, beating estimates. Unfortunately, for the Philippines, I don't think it's going to happen. For the second quarter earnings season, which is happening right now, um, we've uh, several companies have already come out with earnings. And so far, they have all been disappointing because of higher costs, um, you know, being hurt by inflation. It was a problem in the second quarter, and it's showing. Pag walang earnings growth, Wala, diba? And I think uh, even for U.S. and global companies, people want proof that you know uh, the trade war isn't going to be a problem. And I think they'll look at the third quarter and fourth quarter earnings before they safely conclude that, yes, it's not a problem. So we won't see that until end of the year. So again, I mean, these are the catalysts. And 
it will take long for them to materialize. That's our concern. Um, yes, our target is 8.6, but the catalyst for the market to go there uh, might take a while take to a materialize. While. Okay, so, baka sabihin nyo kasi sobrang bearish. Oo nga, natatakot na ako. But that said, uh, that's why, you know, I want to say what the good news is. Um, I agree with Juanes that um, we've seen the bottom at 6.9. Um, you know, based on historical corrections, the average drop of the market is 17%. And um, we've actually seen that already. At a 17% drop, the, mar the market should be trading at 7,495, okay? So we actually fell below that. And in terms of duration, three months. We've been in this correction for more than three months. So the magnitude and duration is already there, okay? And um, in terms of valuations, okay, for because um, just to make it easier for everybody, you know, rather than talk about each and every stock, you'll see that uh, among the index constituents, when the blue bar is below um, the zero line, it just means that it's trading at a valuation which is below its 10-year historical average. And you can see that most of the stocks are currently trading below their 10-year historical averages, except for a handful of stocks like SM Prime, SM Meralco, um, URC, and SEC BBDO, no? But most of them are parang, parang bear market valuations na. Murang mura right. na talaga sila. Um, showing that negatives are priced in. And this is another evidence that negatives are priced in. Um, you know, in January, we talked about, or I highlighted the fact that I was concerned about the forecast on inflation. Because in January, they said um, the economists were in anticipating an inflation of 3.6% in the Philippines, which, in my opinion, was a very low forecast. But as of today, you can see that the inflation forecast has been increased to 4.5%. 10-year bond rate, you know, initially they're saying it's only 5.3. Now it's, they're saying we'll probably end the year at 6.2. Um, EPS forecast for companies, naging conservative na rin, nag-cut na by 4.6%. And, well, for us, PSEI target is now down to 8.6. And in terms of what is being reflected in the market, the PSEI is down 16.5%. In other words, nag-derate na tayo. No? Uh, from 20 times PE, we're now at 17 and a half times PE. And our 10-year bond rate has gone up already a lot. Um, in fact, it's, it's really 6.7, not 6.6 .6 from 5% mm -hmm. earlier this year. So a big adjustment really for interest rates and prices such that it's a lot more attractive. And my feeling is the negatives are priced in. No? Okay, so... Uh and finally, pala. Mm -hmm. okay, um, one of the factors that people said were important was economic growth. You shouldn't be worried about it. We don't have any problems as far as economic growth is concerned. Um, the first quarter, you saw GDP increasing by 6.8%. E eh, di ba nga kagabi si Trump pinagmamalaki yung 4% ng US? O tayo 6.8, di ba? So that's, you know, that's nothing. 4% is nothing, di ba, for the Philippines. Um, and one of the factors which drove um, uh, economic growth strongly was government spending. So tax reform program isn't bad. It seems bad because of inflation, but this is what allowed the government to increase their spending by 13.6% in the first quarter, which is the reason why we had a 6.8% growth. And second quarter, it's still going to be strong because if you look at the headlines, it's saying the government increased the disbursements by... 14.9%. And then going forward, um, we go to the next slide. Um, the budget for next year has already been disclosed and we're seeing a 13% increase um, in the budget for next year. Um, and the DPWH uh, budget for infrastructure is up 68.3%. And well, for usually for upper class people, you don't like uh, 
a weak peso because you can't travel, imported products are import. expensive. <laughs> but it's actually, a weak peso is actually good uh, for OFW remittances. Um, consumers end up spending more. Okay, and people who earn a minimum wage, for example, and you know, 25,000 and below actually had an increase in their disposable income because of the tax reform. So those are the reasons why we're still positive. To me, uh, oil to me is the number one commodity that generates movement into that inflation rate. So mm -hmm. oil prices have been actually on an up move that's been quite aggressive. Um, there were certain issues that were coming up. Some have to do with geopolitical concerns that kept uh, oil on that run. I don't see any immediate uh, change in the trend that we still have a, an upward bias into oil prices, but we are a little bit on the lower end of the, of, the, of the channel that it's currently at. It might be able to even go sideways or a little bit down to hit the lower end of that, which is, I think, closer to about $67 per barrel. But the general soup is still upward, and until we break below that 67, the potential for oil to remain into that particular move is, is quite strong, and it might even go all the way up to $75. So. Uh, I think there's still that increasing threat. In terms of, yeah, we can go to the next. In terms of metals, um, if you notice what's being out, it's actually against the inflationary impact because uh, precious metals and base metals have actually gone down. And the reason that's going down is because you've had a strong dollar. And uh, as the dollar continues to keep its strength inside and we've been getting battered on these uh, particular price sides, that's why you've noticed some local stocks that are on the mining side have not really been responsive. Some are still moving on speculation, but primarily those that are based on the earnings is still quite weak. I think Felix reported earnings that was also quite weak. And by the looks of what you're seeing there, since you're seeing those lower prices moving lower, uh, the impact on those companies will more likely still be sustained. But I don't think that will be adding to too much on the inflationary threat. Now, with regards to the Philippine peso, Unfortunately, I still see weakness. Uh, we might be able to get some sideways movement for the meantime, but uh, the trend here is still on that weakening stand. The peso dollar rate, as you can see in the chart, is still on an upward trend. And uh, we're going to be coming closer to that trend line soon, and that means it's going to put pressure on the peso to, to see whether it's going to stand there or whether it's going to start to devalue once again. So uh, at the low side of the peso, I'm thinking support between maybe 53 at a maximum, maybe 52, 62. On the upside of that, maybe up to 54, 50, maybe looking for two months. The possibility of 55 is still there. I know I've been hearing that a lot from the market now. And uh, uh, I still don't see any major impact, maybe just a bit more slower rather than too much of an aggressive stand. And whatever more sideways rather than an upward move you see in that particular rate would be clearly be welcome because I'm in favor of the stability rather than too much, uh, you know, too much weakness coming into that particular rate. But trend remains the same. Going back to our survey question, Kanina, and we've asked them about their views on the market. I don't think in Mr. Juan is, uh, what are we looking at here uh, from this potential first sign of recovery? Uh, can this potentially bring us all the way back to the 9,000 level? I do not think so. <laughs> um, again, there were a lot of things that we had to factor in that were not present at the time. Um, the speedier upward in rates, like we talked about, inflationary threat, the, the not so exciting corporate earnings growth you were looking at, as, as she said. What you're seeing is a market that got soused down, was very oversold generated a rebound and that market after it tries to normalize its price is going to have to determine okay are things normal again can can growth take me back up to a higher level and if it's unexciting then your market will coast after it hits that normalized level and so i'm thinking that's what what this rally that you're seeing is going to generate that condition but again i would agree with april and she's because she made a stand she's saying that i think we've seen the market low and that being the 6.9 low. And I more likely agree with that particular case. And there are a few evidences of why that's so, right? Uh, can I, okay. So we have first, uh, if you look at the Philippine Stock Exchange Index, we'll deal with the Elliott wave. Um, I did present this on, my, on the first half. And uh, I, I was talking about, I was a little concerned because we were going up in an intermediate trend into a fifth wave. And I was anticipating that we're gonna have a corrective wave. But if you can see there, the chart on the right side shows almost 
you know, a vertical drop. And this is unusual. Normally at, at this phase, if you don't see a counter rally, that's telling you that the trend here is very weak. And so the rally you see there was a very small sideways motion, as you see here in the mm -hmm. lower right side. It, it felt like a market that could not even breathe back up after being oversold. And that's to me is a concern. But if you look at the chart on the left side, it did bounce off the blue line, which is the uptrend line that we've had since 2011-12. And so far, it hasn't broken that. And that's very material for us, because at least the market still respects that major support. And it feels as of this time that it was an untoward decline and re requires that particular rebound for now. Now, another reason, uh, I know April showed you the, uh, the state of corrections throughout. Um, I put this in, in a little bit more proper perspective. So in terms of looking at the pullbacks we've seen the market have done, so let's say if you're looking at the ones that we've started roughly after 2010, uh, the reactions that came in after that time, it's, you have about three or four of them now, and each one of those particular declines on average would pull back maybe by about 23.4%, right? Just to put a little note on that value, 23.4% which means it crosses what we call the bearish territory, which is a drop of 20% from the high of a market. Now, that's why we know whenever that normally happens, at least so far in the last few years, and people come running up to me and say, oh my God, one is bear number two, bear market na. And I said, the mere fact you're telling me that or you're pointing it out to me puts a smile on my face because every time it happens, the market rebounds. And that's why in the study of technical analysis, there are two qualifications that tell you whether you enter a bear market. The first is, yes, the market must go below 20% from its high. But there's a second qualification that not to people talk about. The market must stay down there by more than two months. And the reason is because you might just get a flash shell off because of emotion, because of worry, because of whatever external event. But if it doesn't stay down below that 20% for that duration, and it recovers right away, then it's just, you know, it's an oversold condition, perhaps driven by mania or emotion, and the recovery of the market shows you that it's not sustainable. Okay, so I want to cast that fear out for now, right? I, thought, I was wondering when you said earlier, it looks like the ingredients are coming back, so we'll watch that very carefully. Another thing that you'll also see in there, uh, there, uh, if I may borrow the PE band again, right? Um, the PE band shows an average PE low of about, low side PE about 15.9 times. Uh, I think these are forward numbers. Right? And, and the numbers he's showing you roughly at about this level, the market also shows major lows. So corrections up to about 23% usually establish lows. PE band of about these lows usually establish lows. Another thing that also uh, we talked about in the beginning also of the year was that I anticipated a roughly a five to seventh month correction time because roughly that's roughly the average period corrections normally last so far as, as registered. And so if the average correction time was about six and a half months, we're coming quite, kind of close to that period already since we began. So there's another factor that says enough is enough. And uh, this is the reason why I think the market is trying to breathe itself back into life. Of course, the argument against me is at the time, we were having all those corrections in the past. We did not have inflation running. We did not have interest rates running. And these are the concerning matters that might change the picture. Now, we'll, I guess time will tell whether in the next six months or eight months whether such uh, threats will continue. And if, if inflation does taper off, as the government is suggesting, who knows? Maybe we'll be able to see a bit more of that rally come into place. Another issue, just to also point out, just wanna make sure you guys are aware of this, August is our favorite month of the year because it is the worst performing month in the stock market for the year. And if you can see the graph you're seeing there, the seasonality chart, you can see the, the lowest performing, not only that, it also produces a negative, and it normally comes right after the previous month, which is one of the strongest months of the year. Have we just had a strong July? Yes. Yeah, so we did about 6.5% as of Thursday, which actually outperforms what you're seeing there, which is standard about 3% for July normally. So after coming from a very, very strong month, and it says there, does it look like you have the capacity to come down again in the ghost months? Well, you can play with that thought, 
but as far as I'm concerned, the statistics show that there's a possibility, especially after coming from a strong month, we just had a 6.5% six and, six and recovery. There is some downside here. So I think the way I would look as an opportunity here is, okay, if you prepare yourself, if we may have a weak August or possibly even a weak November, you might want to be, you know, gradually looking for opportunities coming towards the end of these months, right? Because the market jumping up the way it did to me is the first testament of strengths. But coming from a very weak condition, you're not going to have the market lighting up immediately. It takes some time. So you might ask, so when would be a proper time to enter? You wait for those months to finish. That might give you a better possibility in terms of the timing essence. All right. This is the way I expect the market to show itself to you. All right. I've, I will run two scenarios. Let's start with the first. So if you see the downward channel that you have there on the left side of your chart, and we see prices breaking over that trend line now, we've just done that. So roughly in that particular area, that's the first area that you, that's going to trigger the potential recovery, right? So this is usually the first rally. The first rally normally is the biggest because it catches people unprepared. A lot of people have not put their positions back in yet. So when they see prices going up, some people say, I've seen that going up, it normally goes down, and this time it didn't go down. And now, as it is elevated, you're saying, so what do I do? Am I going to miss the boat? So nine out of 10 people who normally convince themselves to buy in this rally, buy it near the high. Only because you're waiting for too much evidence to do that. And of course, trend line is helpful and all that. Unfortunately, after that, you're going to get a sideways consolidation coming. It could come in two forms. It could go, if the market is strong, it will just go sideways, right? Just like what happened in the last correction. It jumped up, went sideways, broke out, and went straight up. Or, and I think this is probably going to be a case is in the first case, you'll see prices start to go down again like a downward channel or a wedge or a triangular pattern like you see there. What I don't like to happen is a retest of the previous low. Because it might be a little scary. Because as it retests that low, there's a small possibility it might even break it for a while, get everybody spooked up again, everybody cast their positions out only to find out recovery back in place. That's OK. That's what we call a double bottom. That's how they normally craft themselves. So I'm thinking these are the two scenarios you just have to be prepared for. So just be careful this rally you're seeing immediately, because I don't think, I don't think this rally is it yet. Right? But it is testament that it looks like the worst is over for now, and the market just needs to base build. And that base building process takes a little bit of time. It needs to convince more people like us that you know, the markets are good, value, uh, good in valuation, that to gradually buy it, because there are still some headwinds existing. That's not over, and it needs time to generate ourselves out of that condition to create more forceful impact into the, into the ability of that. So finally, just to show you an example, so the you picture there on the left is an example. Of, that's, a real, that's a real issue. So the first one is uh, Banco de Oro, and I showed you a picture back in 2015, 2016. So here's an example. So you see the downtrend there on the left side, shooting up, going above the trend line, and working up this correction that comes in later. And mind you, that took a few months to build. All right, so you may have to anticipate this. So if some of you guys are working into this rally, I would prepare you for another pullback. Okay, so just ingat, ingat lang. You might be able to get that in good time. So again, normally the first big rally, that's just your tip off, things are changing. Then reaction consolidation to try to retest support and engage new accumulation, and eventually the market will turn. And the second example is a bubble, double bottom, and you have pretty much the same conditions coming out there. Uh, this happened in Ayala land. So I would really prefer the first one, although you might not like it. But to me, I give very clear evidence that market uh, turnaround conditions are taking place. Later, when we talk about some individual stocks, I'll show you examples like that. I have a quick question. One is because I'm the one of the few, I think, a few people who actually bought that huge rally. And talking about this second chart that, is, that you've shown here, there's a possibility that it will retest and break the previous low. So how do you know? If that low is going to tutuloy ba, or is well, it going to finally do that? It's not the job. Whether you, kung tumuloy siya, then you take your longer vacation. Okay. But, <laughs> but we're, what we're hoping for is, like we, yes. we said earlier, there are good right. evidence that those lows will likely hold. Okay. Right? And right. that uh, the context of which that 
you're asking is when do I enter again? If you're into a rally right now, my advice is start taking some off the table. Okay. And that means you take some profits first just to secure what you've made into the short term. If the market does go down, that gives you the ability to have some cash available for this next reaction. Right. If you keep yourself completely in and that thing starts to turn down a little bit, in the beginning you might say, oh, kaya ko to, now I can survive that next reaction. Anyway, I know it's eventually going to go up. You know, let that go for one or two months and let's see if you say the same thing. Because I'm sure as that market starts to turn down, you're going to be convincing yourself otherwise. So first it's, Oh, kaya ko to. Next is, kakayanin ko ba to? <laughs> and next, hindi ko na kaya. <laughs> right? And you're the one selling when that, in, when that thing breaks the previous low and that's when the next low comes. I know, it doesn't sound good, but it's best to be prepared for it so we don't get involved in it. But that's how we learn. And that's the context of it. So you're learning, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. So again, if you have any questions, just feel free to ask us. Do we have any questions, guys, from the panel? So no questions. All right, uh, so just moving on to our, of course, our fourth round of uh, our discussions. We talk about the stock picks. So before that, uh, we uh, like to show you again the results of the survey that we've, uh, we've taken when you registered. No? So these are all questions answered by our CUL Premium customers who registered to this event. And um, uh, first is that, what is your exposure? Uh, what do you plan to do with your exposure in the stock market for the next 12 months? And 52% mentioned that they want to increase their positions, right? And the, the chart to your uh, right, uh, we asked, uh, again, our customers, the percentage of their funds invested in direct stocks or mutual funds. And 30% uh, has uh, answered that uh, 50 to 75% of their resources are in stocks or in equity mutual fund. Well, 34% are in 75% uh, and above, so almost full allocation. So with the regard to the, our recommendations, let's ask April first about her, uh, for those clients who are already exposed, no? what are the segments or at least the sectors that you like that they should probably uh, not consider or the, the new sectors that they would uh, most likely try to rebalance into. Okay. So, so before that, no, um, just like to say again, um, I think you know, Juan is kind of paints what uh, I'm thinking fundamentally that, you know, yes, I think we've seen the bottom, but, you know, um, it's not going to be a sharp recovery all the way back to 9,000. We're probably going to stay here. And mm -hmm. that said, um, rather than doing it, all at once, buying all at once. Do you, you want me to flash the slowly. strategies? Uh, that's Second okay. So we can just start accumulating. Um, mm -hmm. And for those who are still not invested, you know, this might be, you know, waiting for the perfect time. This might be your perfect time already. Um, okay, so for the sectors that I like, um, again, we, we we already talked about how much we like gaming and property before. We still like it. Um, financials, we like it, but before it was expensive. Now it's become cheaper, so it's more, ex more attractive. I think what has changed now is um, we have become more bullish on telcos mm -hmm. and cement. These are two sectors that we have become more positive on. Um, but on the other hand, we have become more negative on power. Okay. Okay, so right. I think those are the major changes. So we can talk about the different sectors later, okay. So just talking about why we're positive about um, these sectors. So for the property, um, we're seeing actually strong take-up sales. I think mga two years or three years ago, people were worried about weak demand or oversupply on the condominium segment. But the property developers stopped launching for a while. Mm -hmm. And now the demand is actually much stronger versus the launches. And I think one factor that, one surprise factor that materialized is the entry of a lot of um, the Chinese workers working for online gaming operators. Um, they're actually buying a lot of condominiums. The demand is very strong from there. Um, demand from office, which people thought would dry up uh, because of the entry of Trump, did not dry up. It's, in fact, very strong. So, 
so it's not an issue. I think one of the reasons why property stocks are not recovering as much as they should based on the earnings performance is people are worried that rising interest rates will lead to weaker demand. So I think that's one headwind. But I think as long as interest rates don't go up sharply, um, the demand will still stay strong because the amortizations will not be affected that much if interest rate increases are limited. So for the gaming, um, we're seeing strong growth in gross gaming revenues, which is the reason why we're not really worried about it. But the risk, of course, is we see weak demand from Chinese players. Um, for financials, we, we like it because of the strong demand for loans. You know, the economy is very strong, therefore you're seeing pickup in loans. And with rising interest rates, the loans are becoming more expensive. Okay, and what we're seeing is that the pricing of loans are increasing faster than the cost of deposits, leading to higher margins. Okay, but I think, well, the risk is that right now, banks have a loan to deposit ratio of at the 70% level. Mm -hmm. It's meaning that, it just means that the deposits of of people are 70% lent out, okay? And we have a reserve requirement of 18%, which is why, you know, if you go to your banks right now, diba, they are more aggressive in, you know, um, encouraging you to make time deposits at higher rates of, say, 3%. Now, what's unheard of before? So if funding becomes tighter, the margins, I mean, they, they might be forced to, um, increase rates and that would squeeze their margins, no? Okay, so, okay, the telcos, why have we become more positive? I think if you look at the earnings of the telcos, more, for Globe, for example, more than 50% of the profits are already data, data profits, meaning yung mga broadband, um, yung internet, whatever. And, and revenues, data revenues are growing double-digit levels, yan eh. Um, whereas yung mga legacy business, which is your SMS, phone calls, whatever, they're, they're now less than 50%. So that's the shrinking segment. So now, it's a stronger argument that, you know, profits have seen the worst. They're now turning on a more sustainable basis. Um, of course, the risk is the threat of the third telco player. But mm -hmm. for me, you know, since... Uh, since President Duterte started talk on, talking about the third telco, a lot has changed. Um, these telco companies are investing 40 billion a year on capital expenditures. The quality of service has improved. Um, secondly, the cost of data is so much cheaper right now. So um, actually, I think for us, because we have plan data plans, we don't really know, we don't really feel it, but um, you know, we, like, syempre, ang tinatanong ko yung maid ko parati. Sabi ko, magkano ng data ngayon? So, like my maid, she will load um, her plan, or her prepaid plan, 50 pesos. And sabi niya dati, 1 GB lang yun. But prior to 2016, walang 1 GB ang 50 pesos. Ngayon, 1 GB. But meron pang, but there's more, di ba? It's uh, another 2 GB of additional apps. And unlimited Facebook, mga ganun. Mga, yeah, plus, uh, I think Smart has plus 1 GB per day of YouTube for a total of uh, 4 GB for 50 pesos. So if you're a third telco player, you have to compete with that 4 GB for 50 pesos. How much, I mean, diba? It's The cost is so small, so you're getting very small revenues. You have to you have to compete, so it's very difficult for you to compete today versus, say, two, three years ago. The cost is, um, or the price is much higher, so very competitive for them. Um, for the cement companies, things during the first quarter, uh, for the first time, prices have started stabilizing, um, and because of the build, 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 the demand for cement has been very strong, um, but. My worry really is the imports from Vietnam are still coming in. So, problema pa rin yun. Um, and earnings have not been good so far for CHP because 
um, the costs were actually increasing. But at least, you know, one of the major problems, uh, which is the imports high price or the low price has been addressed. Okay, and valuations are cheaper. Okay, and for the consumer companies, the positive is we're still seeing demand being very strong. The problem is consumer companies are the most vulnerable to high inflation. First of all, um, there is always a risk that the demand will be, be hurt if uh, inflation is high. And second, of course, the cost is very sensitive. They're very sensitive to higher cost, consumer companies. Okay. Um, and for the power, the reason why we've become more negative is because um, the price of power has been uh, going down because of oversupply of uh, power generation, uh, the power generation sector, and um, rising fuel costs for them. So, bumababa na yung revenues, tumataas pa yung cost, which is not good. Okay, now, so for the 53% naman April that, uh, you know, wasn't to increase their exposure in the stock market, what are your picks? Um, okay, so I think we have quite a bit. We have, some of them are the same, like Ayala Land, um, we continue to like it. Um, we've been recommending this stock. And um, of course, it's a well-diversified property company with a strong brand name. And... Uh, it has a five-year profit target of earning 40 billion by 2020. So looks like as of today, it's on track to do that. Okay, and valuations. Well, believe it or not, the valuations of Ayala Land today is still very attractive. Um, they're trading at 21 times PE, which you might say, well, that's not cheap. But remember, in the past, I remember when I was an analyst in the 1990s, Ayala Land would trade at a premium to net asset value and trade at 30 something times PE. So at 20 times, 21 times PE, um, you know, that's a steep discount from the 10 year average of 28. Okay. And uh, of course, rising rates is a major concern. So Mega World is the next property stock that we like. Um, you know, it has one of the best land banks really with largest office leasing portfolio in BGC. And in the past, it was, a, it was more of a property developer, but now it's, it's having a more balanced portfolio, including rentals. Nevertheless, the valuation is still very attractive, 42% discount to net asset value, but let's focus more on the price to book value, which is only one times. Ibig sabihin, we're valuing it as if you know, th yeah, there's no future or based on the value of the properties that they bought so many years ago, which of course we know is not the reality anymore, diba? And in terms of PE, Ayala Land is 20 times, this one is 9 times PE. So, so very, very cheap stock. No? Okay, then, then Bloomberry, we still like it. Um, the leader in the gaming sector. Um, Profits are growing strongly, and in terms of valuation, um, we think that it can still uh, trade at higher valuations because the industry average, which includes the Macau players, is at 12 times EV over EBITDA, enterprise value over EBITDA, and um, Bloom is at 7.8 times EV EBITDA. Okay, so Metro Bank which is, uh, well, it has been sold off quite a bit because of rumors that it was victimized by a new loan scam, diba? But I think the, the main proof that, diba, they denied it. But of course, people are gonna say, so what, I'll deny everything naman eh. But I think the major evidence that it really wasn't uh, hit by it was at 69 pesos, you saw Alfred T buying 5 million shares of Metro Bank. So why would you, as an insider, why would you buy that stock if you feel that you really, you know, you were lying, you know? So that said, you know, valuations are very attractive. It's at 1.1 times price to book versus uh, your BDO at 1.8 and BPI 1.7. Okay, and Security Bank, uh, this is a relatively new stock pick. 
It's actually one of the favorite stocks of institutional investors that have re-rated recently because um, it has successfully transitioned from a trading bank into a, a lending bank. Okay, so it focused on consumer, the consumer segment, and this is bearing fruit as lending to the consumer segment has been growing quite a bit, and this has allowed its margins to improve. <coughs> And it's currently trading at 1.3 times price to book, um, which is more than one standard deviation below its five-year historical average. Meaning that during the five years, it traded at a premium to 1.3 times price to book, um, I think 86% of the time. So 15% of the time, she nag trade below 1.3 times. Okay. So DNL, I know I said I'm not too optimistic about consumers, but for DNL, the reason why we're more optimistic is um, in terms of raw material costs, um, its raw materials are actually not increasing in price because bulk of its raw materials are coconut oil and palm oil. Napababa yung presyo. Unlike, say, the others who consume, say, chicken or beef, napataas talaga yung price, di ba? And... Um, it's also more resilient to the weak peso because it has exports. So neutral, it's not going to be affected by the weak peso. And valuation-wise, um, it's trading at par with other uh, peers, not um, despite the fact that its earnings growth is faster. Okay. And then Semirara. Okay. It's although we're not too bullish on um, power companies. The reason why Semirara is different is because it owns its own uh, coal, coal supply, because it owns a coal mining plant. And this is offsetting the weakness of um, the power sector, which is good. Um, and it's only trading at 8.4 times PE, and the insiders are buying this stock. OK. And AC. Well, um, it's a well-diversified uh, holding company, okay, and it's, you know, it's entering into power and looks like that planned entry is actually yielding some success, giving investors another reason to buy AC because the criticism is all its subsidiaries are listed anyway, so what's the reason why I should buy AC? Okay, so valuations again are cheaper than the historical average. Okay, uh, but right now, medyo nag rally na siya. So let's wait for share prices to pull back before we look at this again. Okay, and uh, between the two telcos, our preferred pick is Globe. Um, because um, CPLDT kasi, uh, less than 50% of revenues are in the data business. But Globe, more than 50% na. So... Mas nauna si ano eh, mas nauna si Globe, kaya mas gusto natin. And in terms of uh, mobile, it's the clear leader versus sa uh, uh, PLDT Smart, no. So so yan. And again, uh, competitiveness against potential third telco is much stronger at this stage because of the 40 billion, 40 to 50 billion capex that they're spending now. Uh, valuations, well. Um, I think medyo malaki na rin rally, pero if it corrects, definitely it's an opportunity to buy the stock more. Okay. And then Eagle Cement. Well, Eagle is our preferred um, cement pick because it's more efficient compared to the others, making it more competitive. Um, and um, it plans to increase its production capacity, which should allow profits to also grow faster. But again, the valuations, major, you know, the stock has gone up. Um, it's not as attractive, but definitely if the stock pulls back, it's an opportunity to buy um, Eagle. Right. So yeah, that's just a summary um, of our stock picks. So I just want to point out, no, because we added Eagle and um, Globe, we just feel like they, there are still some risks there. So maybe if you want to add this to your portfolio, you, you should 
um, manage the size, limit it to say 5% of your portfolio because, well, for telcos, operation-wise, I don't think there's much risk. But of course, if you have the government every day saying, you know, we want a third telco to come in and all of that, it's not exactly good for the stock. So we want to limit it at a certain amount. And for cement, I'm saying, you know, the sector is not yet perfect at this mm -hmm. stage because right. the imports continue to come in. Okay. All right. So um, um, thank you very much for those uh, picks, April. Now let's move on to... Uh, the discussion with uh, Sir Juanes. So before that, let me again uh, talk to you guys about uh, the results of uh, the survey that we asked our customers. So we asked uh, all of you, which type of stock do you think will do best in the next 12 months? And 50% of you mentioned the blue chips, which apparently over the last correction was the ones to suffer the most. 28% says growth stocks, while 15% says the value or cheap stocks, while only 7% talk about the small caps. Now, Sir Juanis, uh, <laughs> a quick question. You know. uh, for people who asked about you know, the, the blue chips, what do you think are the good uh, mid to large cap picks that we can consider, at least in a technical perspective? You know? <clears throat> All right. Um, I think in the next few months, you're going to have a very split market. That means you're going to have a mixture of blue chip or middle sized and even small cap issues all move. Uh, but they may do so rotatingly. And the reason for that is because um, as some of these other bigger issues are probably just going to make a technical rally and then come back. I still think that loose money will find their way in the exciting issues, the ones that you think will only be 7%. <laughs> but um, I, I think the underlying factor, like I pointed out earlier, is that we need to be able to see substantial uh, evidence that these markets have been able to stabilize already. So what I'll do is uh, to pick, just give you a sense, I'll, I'll present four issues that I feel have, are showing those signs of resurgence or at least of a basing pattern. And I'll explain to you why I see it and so that you can look for companies that look quite similar to them so you can do it your, on your own. So for example, let's have a look at Globe Telecom. As April felt very, I mean, of course, solidly about the recovery coming from Globe. If you notice the orange line or the orange chart there, um, again, you'll see a downtrend line broken with the first surge in Globe. Uh, mind you, this took place quite earlier uh, in the year, so the Globe's movement is way advanced than the rest of the market. So you see the first surge that you see up there, and look at that consolidation pattern, which is one of the things I pointed out to you earlier on. Right? So Globe did exactly that this year. And recently, it's pushed up above that uh, wedge-like pattern, and it's, well, right now, very, very strong on its ascent. Uh, and that particular condition is already telling you that this stock had bottomed out because it's gone through the consolidation phase already and it's now pushed above. So I would agree with April though that you might want to wait for globe prices to come back down before you'd be picking it up. But at least it tells you not only is the worst over here, but globe's trend is already on the up move, right? So these ones, every pullbacks you get through globe are opportunities for you to be able to buy that. But again, just look at the basic sense here because I'm going to go to the next issue here, which is MPI. Now, MPI looks like the same kind of pattern that you're seeing here in MPI's end as well. The only difference is it's not broken out of that triangular pattern yet. It's still locked into that consolidation zone. This is the reason why the other day when MPI rallied so briskly, next thing you know, it flooded itself down two or three days in a row as if, you know, as if the sellers were so in a hurry to sell. And the reason for that is because the basic accumulation phase is not finished. Whoever is accumulating this, and I don't mean one person, whoever is accumulating this still needs time to accumulate the, the shares. And there's a lot of shares of this available. And that's the reason it takes normally a little bit longer than usual. So anticipate that you're going to see that cascading flow until perhaps maybe even the latter portion of the end of that triangle. Once it moves above that red line or breaks out from that red line, you'll probably see a much more intensification process. So my advice to you is now that it's still down here and whipping back down, try to take advantage of it right gradually along that channel. When it breaks above that red line, you have to be a bit more aggressive in your purchases. Next slide, please. So the next one is SM. Now I notice SM is still on the top tier of your valuation band as I know to your historical average. So valuation-wise, maybe not very, very nice. 
But one thing I liked about it is that, of course, of course, the decline in the beginning was very sharp, but it was more gradual on its, on its turn. And eventually, the downtrend has already been broken. So again, I'll do the same thing what we're doing in global. Wait for this to pull back, and I'll look for opportunities to buy SM into that type of a, of a pullback. Because it seems like the worst is over. So hopefully here, the worst is it'll come back down, make a higher low, and then try to be able to gradually resurface. In Mega World, I also like the formation, but a bit more self-composed. Here you have, you may have time. It's here trying to rally, and you're coming closer to resistance right now. So, I think I'd buy this on the way down rather than where it is, because you might have some downside impact for this. I think it just needs to wind up a little bit more for Mega World before it resuscitates itself. You can be more aggressive, uh, perhaps as it pulls back down closer to support, or maybe later if you want to put in a trading position for speed, you wait for that red line on top to be able to, to handle itself. But so far I've seen base informations from this four already, and I think that's a very good sign, at least for the long haul. So. Uh, take advantage of any pullback you get from these particular four. Right, in, terms, so yeah, in terms of the smaller uh, league stocks, okay, um, okay, before I do anything else here, the usual disclaimer, okay? <coughs> These are only for the people who are in fit of health. <laughs> Movements here can be very volatile. Okay, and that means as fast as it can go up, you can probably get a surge down in prices as well. So you might have to be a little bit more careful with these things. Okay, so let's look at four issues that I'm seeing interesting patterns build again. But let's start with the first one, which is TBGI. And here in Trans-Pacific Broadband, I want to be able to show you how to watch for these stocks. If, if you're going to run through them anyway, you might as well know how to do it in better fashion, right? The very first spike you see on the left side, normally these are very spontaneous. They catch people off guard. They go up very fast because no, no one is able to buy. And so you're forced, if you want to participate, to buy it higher and higher and higher every day, up to the point that it seems it's never coming down. Until the insider, the guy controlling this, is going to say, wow, you guys like this company better than I at this price, so I will give you everything you want. <laughs> and so. That's why the major correction comes back down. And now you get that big pullback. And after giving somebody the opportunity to make so much money, that person says, all right, it's falling quite a bit. They've gave me all this extra money. I will put my, my uh, interest back. And that's why it starts to round or flatten off. And that's what you see that part where it says the wind, uh, the wind down area. After that wind down area, supply will tighten once again. And after its supply tightens, you see the next race that comes up, and you see with that the pitch and pull movement that's going to come. It shoots up again, and then after it shoots up, it starts to prepare the next pattern. So since we're in that, in, at least in the first chart, we're now in that first area. Now we're waiting for to see if prices can resuscitate itself from that area. So if you guys are trading stocks like this, you have to be mentally prepared that if you're going to participate here, then you're going to have to put a little bit of a stake now. Because you don't want this to, to do it whilst that thing is erupting like a volcano, because you'd be paying all the lousiest prices for it. Now, as it comes to be able to do that, you cannot put too much money here because there's a chance that could still break down. So you have to put a little bit of a position there so that when it starts to be able to push off, you can add and you can get a pretty good average price and ride a relatively fair amount of these particular movements. But Look at the phase of involvement because later you will see the movements are pretty much the same no matter what uh, stock I will show you. The next stock I have there is now, and just to let you know, now was one of your top 10 requested stocks. Am I right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. So, and uh, as now comes inside, you try to guess where you are in the first phase. Where, where am I here? You can see you've not gone into the last pitch and, uh, pitch and pull phase yet. You're still in this consolidation phase. Now, I know you might be getting excited because the price is right on the red line now, and you might think, oops, it might break out already. But remember, look at, look at the first chart. It went back to that red line. It had one more pullback to support before it broke out. So that's why over here, don't be putting an aggressive amount because you might think, ako na lang magbreak out nito. Tignan natin kung andar yung barko. Please, don't put too much until it's time, okay? There might be one more swing for, for now before it even attempts to be able to move on. 
Another two stocks to be able to watch out for is, uh, well, please remember, I'm telling you things, there are absolutely zero fundamental involved there that at least I know of. I know there's a lot of rumors going around with all these companies, but these are not fundamentally based picks. That's why the April's not talking about them. Okay, but here's another issue, same thing. First upsurge, major sell-off, wind down with the base out, shoots up again, and now it's winding up for an attempt to be able to move back. And again, even in this other one on the right side, when you have Mambuhai doing exactly the same thing. So here in the next few, I would say in the next one or two weeks, we're probably gonna get decisions from some of those smaller issues. So for those that break out, then that might be something you might want to be able to trade with a small amount of your portfolio. Yeah. I said small, uh, not small, small. And that's what you guys are gonna have to be able to, to watch out for. Now, I think there'll be activity here because like I said, markets will rotate. Right. Some of the blue chips that just rallied and take some profits from these rallies, I'm sure money is gonna come here. So even a little bit of money coming in here might inspire some activity so you can watch some of these issues inside. All right. Uh, that's all we have uh, time for in the panel discussion. Let's now move on to the exciting part of the top 10 stocks that you've requested. Remember that you answered the uh, question Nathan, when you registered and we asked you about the stocks you wanted to ask. And here we're going to talk about, oh, uh, about them one by one. So first, um, we have um, a stock called SMPH. April. Okay. Fundamentally, we have no problems with this stock. In fact, um, you know, the reason why it's, I think, stronger than all the other stocks is because it's the most defensive uh, property stocks with 72% of income from malls, okay? And uh, another thing exciting about uh, SM Prime is plans to reclaim um, in the uh, Pasay and Paranaque area. So the cost to reclaim is 30 plus thousand per square meter, whereas the selling price right now is 150 to 200 thousand per square meter. So potentially they could stand to make a lot of money from that. Um, and profits are expected to you know, grow by 14% this year, which is you know, very good. Um, the problem is, of course, the valuations. You know, it's really priced to perfection. Uh, 34%, uh, 34 times PE. Okay, it's the most expensive property stock that we have right now. Okay, and of course, there's still this execution risk on the reclamation project right now. If they're not even starting on it. And um, another question that a lot of people ask them really is, you know, yung online shopping. Oh, Iba sa ibang bansa kasi hindi na nagmumol mga tao. Online shopping na lang eh. So here, it's not yet a problem, but... But I think, in a way, they're responding quite well because right now you go to the SM malls, you will see that it's more restaurants, more movies, you know, yeah, less shops. It you go there, it's a lifestyle mall na, na, now. No, so I think they're doing the right thing. But that said, um, you know, what if the transition to online shopping is faster, diba? So we we don't know. It's a potential thing. Tingin ko, isa lang ang answer dyan, aircon eh, no? Mahinit. <laughs> Libre aircon. <laughs> Sir Juanes, care to uh, comment about the stock? All right, so, uh, okay, we just uh, pulled up some of these charts uh, a while ago, so I'll just have a look. Well, SM Prime, as, as you can see from the picture from the midpoint to the right side, it's had some degrees of pull-downs and rallies and pull-downs, but what uh, was nice is that the last reaction it made made a higher low. Uh, so roughly, that's the one that you see in the in the latter portion, and prices managed to be able to make a, a push up. So uh, I think that's quite decent. Again, I don't think it's going to be too much upside because you have a previous high or two previous highs to be able to contend with. So I think you're probably going to run to those ranges and get some selling from there. So just wait for prices to come back down closer to their uh, maybe short or medium term moving averages before you buy SM Prime. But at least fairly better than many of the others that I've seen so far. Okay, all right. MPI, April. Okay. Um, it's one of the worst performing stocks for this year. Um, I think it, it's due to uncertainty surrounding the toll road and water distribution businesses. Kasi di ba, hindi sila makakuha ng rate increase eh. And our valuation models assume that they will get the price increases. 
And, um, you know, but that said, we think the sell-off is really too much. Um, at 4 peso 52 currently, um, you know, MPI is a holding company, so it's, it owns shares in the Toll Road, shares in uh, Manila, but it owns shares in Meralco, hospital, in hospital business. But at 4.52, you don't pay for anything na, as far as the Toll Roads in Manila are concerned. So it's free anyway. So, in other words, the, the bad news is already priced in. Okay, so that's the good news about this stock. It's just so cheap. Um, the, the problem is, well, the, for, the risk is that further delays in the resolution of the rate hike issues for the toll road and water distribution business. But otherwise, you know, I think the bad news is priced in and the valuations are very attractive. Okay. Well, with, with regards to chart, I, I think I pointed this out earlier. It's going through a phase of accumulation and uh, we're just waiting for the tip off before it breaks out from that high side. So. I'd be in the camp of gradually buying MPI now, right? I take advantage of the weakness. I don't think that's gonna last so long anyway, so you might as well do it, and the repercussions will be like a globe telecom effect later on. Next, we have FGen. Okay, so, um, ito, good news na to talaga. Good news na, <laughs> uh, <to> finally. <laughs> I know that a lot of uh, investors have this stuff, but, but finally, I mean, it's actually in a much better position. Tapos na yung bad uh, developments. Kasi um, the ERC finally approved the its new plants uh, supply agreement with Meralco. So th remember I talked about in the past how people were worried that it had a new plant but it couldn't sell the, the power because it didn't have a distribution facility anyway. So finally, nabenta na niya. <laughs> So at least secure na yung earnings niya. And remember recent, uh, last year, late last year, it sold its shares in EDC to a foreign player. And because of that, um, to, to Singapore yan, no? So the free float of EDC is now down to 10.9%. And eventually the free float requirement is going to be 20%. So for those investors who would like to participate in EDC, FGen might be your only way. So pag nauso na naman ng mga renewable energy, baka FGen will be the play for renewables. And valuations, it's only at 7.7 .7 times PE. No? The only remaining concern is the execution of the LNG reclassification project. So what is this anyway? Because um, the plants of FGen are gas plants, so it needs um, gas. The, the Malampaya field is expected to be depleted by 2023, so it needs to import LNG uh, from other countries, but it doesn't have the facility to do it yet, right now. So, of course, the worry is, will it be able to do it or not? So, at least on the positive side, as you mentioned earlier, it was able to raise quite a bit of money um, from the sale of EDC. So, our base case scenario is we assume that they will push through with the gas plant, and um, but the capacity utilization will be much less. So, I think our, our target price of 26 pesos is quite conservative for FGEN. Okay. Um, I only see very positive movements only in the short term, not, not yet in the medium and long term trend perspective for first gen. Uh, it still looks like it needs some time to be able to base out from this particular range and uh, it, it did come closer to that major downtrend line uh, recently, closer to 1570 and it whipped down right away. So again, it still, it still shows you that there are supply issues on the way up. So I think we might have to be a little bit more defensive here until a much more considerable reversal condition has back. I, I do really hope that first gen has, uh, <laughs> is getting out of that state of affairs where a lot of these things uh, happen to them. In, in fact, a couple of years ago, I went and I did a seminar and I went to the province to go on to one of their power plants. And when I was doing a seminar, they had two brownouts while I was there. And they looked at me and they said, sir, we're so sorry. This has never happened before. I said, okay, it means it's me. 
anyway, I really hope that they get to get out of this because, you know, in the last few months, whenever a stock goes into some problem or something, I normally hear people ask me, oh my God, one is, is it going to become another first gen? And it's becoming a benchmark term, which I'm a little afraid, you know, when you get that, that uh, thing, you want to pull out of that as fast as you can. So I hope they've been able to learn out of that. Okay. Next, Jollibee Foods Corporation. Okay. Jollibee, actually, uh, we don't have any problems as far as sales are concerned. Sales are very strong, driven by strong same store sales growth. And they continue to expand their um, number of branches. And the foreign operations are actually finally performing very well. Uh, the problem is, of course, it's vulnerable to higher inflation. Yung nga, mga rising chicken price, rising beef price. Um, and, you know, if inflation is too high, people might opt not to eat in Jollibee. So, yeah, and valuations are a bit on the pricey side at 36 times PE. Okay, industry average is 25 times. All right, one is? All right, well, clearly concerning for me was the big breakdown it broke down from, and you see that very big triangular pattern, it just cracked. And now it's trying to be able to rebound from them, so right now I'm only seeing a recovery back to that breakdown point, if, if at all. Uh, and after it hits that, I'm sure it's gonna whip itself back up and it still needs to do a bo bottoming out process. And so I think for now, sell this first on rally and just wait for the next opportunity to be able to buy it back. Uh, with regards to being overvalued, uh, I think April history has shown us it has always been overvalued and it continues to go up down the road. So wait for the base out and pick it up from there. And I, I think it should be able to do, uh, do well over time. Just so just a quick question because I'm also looking at this particular stock. What type of basic pattern are you looking at? So it went uh, up. More likely, this, so you is, are gonna... this can, is the type that can retest the low or okay. if not break it slightly. All right. Okay. Next, we have uh, PLTT. Okay. So uh, similar, it, it's quite similar to Globe. It's just more delayed. And um, you know, data revenues currently at 44%. Um, of total revenues as of uh, 2017, mas mababa kasi si Globe 50 plus na yan. Eh. So, mas mauna talaga. And, uh, but the difference between Globe and PLDT is that PLDT is, has a niche on fixed line, yung fixed line data. Kasi it had a head start, therefore it has better infrastructure as far as mga home broadband and even mga businesses, the data business, data centers, all of that. So that's really where the growth is coming from. Um, yun nga, that's why, I mean, you know, the mobile business right now, it's lagging behind kasi kay Globe. That's 58% of revenues, which is why medyo it's lagging talaga, which is why we prefer Globe. Uh, valuation, it's, it's reasonable, it's very cheap. 5.6 times EV EBITDA. Um, and about the threat, again, we've said there's the third telco threat, but again, um, our feeling is it's going to be difficult for any new player to come in and compete um, aggressively and successfully with the with both PLDT and Globe. Sir? Well, um... I, I would <laughs> I would take my profit into this rally first and wait for maybe a better basing pattern before uh, this thing will probably turn around. But uh, there's been a slight break in its downtrend line. At least that's a little good part. It's not that much over. And it didn't go through that accumulation pattern like I showed you earlier in Globe, right? So that's what's absent. It seems like uh, people who bought this just bought it for the rally because maybe because of the oversold or maybe discount it had and then now they'll probably go through an unwind phase first. So wait for a consolidation before you can become too aggressive for that. Okay. BDO. Okay. Um, this is actually a favorite um, of institutionals, even ourselves. Um, it's the fastest and largest growing bank. And the recurring income base is very large, which is why people like it. Our issue is that Valuation, we feel like it's fairly valued at 1.8 times price to book. And by the way, the company came out with disappointing earnings last, last, yeah, oh yeah, just this Friday. 
So we feel like there's, you know, we, you can afford to wait as far as video is concerned. Well, um, more likely so, but uh, it looks like it's going through the accumulation phase right now. So I think not so heavy dips are anticipated for BDO. Uh, so if you want to be buying this gradually on the way down, that, that should be fine. But uh, it looks like the worst is over. If we're lucky enough to be able to let that come back down to where the blue line is, I think, I think you should really hands, off, hands on back into that stock as, as, as much as you can. Um, because uh, normally into the rebounds, this is one of the first banks that also resuscitate very quickly. So I'm quite favorable for this. Just buy it over gradually over in time. SM. Okay, it's the largest Philippine conglomerate um, right now. And it's more of a retail play. Um, it has 2,300 retail stores in the country. But it says that it feels like there's more room for it to grow because in the rural areas, a lot of transactions still happen in the informal channels, meaning the sari-sari stores. So they're banking on eventually people buying uh, their products from an SM store, like a Save More or say a department store. Okay, um, and it's a beneficiary of the defensive nature of consumer spending in the Philippines. Because consumer spending in the Philippines always grows consistently. But again, it's a valuation issue for us. It's just expensive, which is why we don't recommend it. Sir? All right. Uh, S SM also broke out of a reactive channel, which is also quite healthy on its technicals. Uh, it did come up with a bit of a surge, so I'd also be inclined to buy this into a slight dip. But uh, so far, it looks like the hard part is over. It'll probably just go to a little bit. Maybe it could even finish its rally and then whip down a little bit. And I think this should be a OK uh, issue to be able to buy for the long term. I, I have no problem with this. URC. Okay, URC. Um, um, unfortunately, we feel like uh, profits from the local operations are no longer in a fast growth phase. Um, I know that URC has been one of the more successful stocks during the past maybe seven, ten years because of the popularity of C2 and uh, the three-in-one coffee, the, the white coffee. But right now, the coffee business is suffering from intense competition from both Nescafe and Copico. Yeah. Um, and the market is not growing, actually. So the two players are aggressively spending on marketing, grabbing market share away from URC. And the profits from that business is going down. And aside from that, yung C2, um, well, first of all, the excise tax on sugary drinks meant higher prices for C2, which in turn hurt demand. And not to mention, uh, drinks like mga iced tea, may uso-uso yan eh. So right now, apparently, hindi na uso ang iced tea. No? Uh, yeah, I don't know what's the new uso, but it's not iced tea. So demand is also being hurt. And again, it's being hurt by rising cost. Okay, so margins are not very good. Uh, valuations for us, not yet, not yet attractive enough. Um, it's still trading at 27 times PE. Yeah, so I, although we've seen a pretty decent rally as it is in URC, it has not even gone up to the 30% zone. Uh, I, I really think this is one of those that will more likely probably try to be able to create a consolidation pattern that might even come lower. So uh, I think this one not too strong as of yet, so I'd like to be on the neutral side. I really want to see what the next couple of weeks will do for this. Uh, but if the catalysts are not really too exciting yet, no need to be able to add too much on risk on this one. The other ones looks quite better as of the moment. Okay. AGI. Okay, um, AGI is actually a very attractive stock in terms of valuation. Um, because first of all, the subsidiaries are already cheap, including Mega World. No? Um, other subsidiaries are Emperador, Resorts World, RWM. So all three stocks are very cheap. But that said, AGI is even cheaper because um, it's trading at a 40% discount to the market-based 
net asset value. Ibig sabihin, market value mo yung RWM, uh, Mega World, and Emperador, mas mura pa. Mas mura pa si AGI. Um, 7.5 times PE. So, really cheap. The problem is, the, reasons why, the reason why, for example, institutional investors are not excited about buying AGI is because the three major subsidiaries which account for 93% of the net asset value are already listed. So, for them, wala namang dahilan bakit bibili nila yan. And not to mention the the performance of Emperador and RWM are currently encountering challenges. So, you know, if I want to buy EGI, I want to buy Mega World directly. Yun yung issue namin. Okay. Sir? Well, again, and it's one of the weaker looking stocks. It's flattening out, not even going up in terms of its rally, and to me that's a concern. So, it, if, if I had the choice to be able to buy this rather than the mega world, I, I clearly will go on the mega world side. So this one has not tipped over and has not even shown substance enough to be able to rebound as of yet. So I'll stay neutral to this, if not defensive. Okay. Next stock, we have CHP. Okay. So, <laughs> so again, the good news is it's Alam going na. to uh, benefit from growing infrastructure spending and the stability of cement prices. Um, and again, similar to Eagle, it has plans to increase production capacity to help profits grow. Pero the problem is compared to the other cement companies, it pays huge royalties to the parents and it's less efficient, um, it, which is why it actually has one of the lower, lower return on equity relative to its peers. And um, of course, we all know yesterday it came out with disappointing earnings um, because of the taxes. I think people are a bit confused what's going on. Because eh. like, the, the revenues are okay, naman, pero what happened as far as taxes are concerned? Why are profits lost? Pa yata, pangit. So, so yun, um, valuations are okay, it's not a problem. Yeah. Sir? Okay, so this is going through a pattern that is known as a rounding bottom. So at first good news, at least bottom. <laughs> rounding, rounding means hindi pa tapos. That means it's in the process of doing that and that you might get that wild cascade, like look what happened, a sharp rally and sharp decline. And you normally see that type of condition as this materializes. My thinking is that you probably need the sector to show some improvement before this follows. So maybe the more efficient ones will move first, do you think? And so if the other ones can generate some upside, it might be able to pull this along with it. But looks like the worst is over for CHP. I take it from some of your responses that you've been there for a while, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so, so you've, you've survived, so you might as well just wait it a little bit longer. <laughs> Give yourself a pat on the back, for heaven's sakes. I wouldn't have survived that. <laughs> okay, see, April, she's the only analyst I know who can say, oh, this company went to disappointing earnings and she's smiling at the same time. <laughs> but like she said, if the other one is more efficient, uh, in fact, the pattern of Eagle looks actually Better. more crisp, right. we'll probably get more decent movements there first before this one. All right. Next stock, we have Cebu Pacific. Okay, so Cebu has been sold down heavily, I think, because it's sensitive to rising oil price and the weak peso. So dollar-denominated expenses account for 65% of cost, um, while oil accounts for 40% of cost. But we feel like the current price already reflects the peso's current weakness, assuming that doesn't weak substantially further from this point, and oil doesn't go up. I think that's the major risk. If if the peso weakens significantly and oil price continue to go up, then di pa rin. Pero if they stay where they're at or you know um, reverse, then I think the valuation is okay now. Did you do a sensitivity on this for oil? Yeah, like for we're, every we're dollar on on that. Yeah, the sensitivity. But based on the current price, it looks like it's. Uh, 
already there. Well, I sure hope it's already there because uh, <laughs> it's been already there, then already there, then already. <laughs> Konti na lang siguro. <laughs> Tsaga na lang konti. <laughs> no, I, I, the worry really here is oil. Because if 40%? Yeah, if it's 40%, then if the trend of oil continues, as we showed you earlier on, that will continue to remain a headwind for, for Cebu Air. And uh, unless we see a breakdown from that trend, this guy might really just stay on the defensive side for now. Although I have seen volume improve in this first rally. But the rally, the, the breadth of the rally was actually very small. That's not a good sign. But the volume means it might take some time before this thing can come around to, to reverse itself. All right. All right, next now. Okay, I know Juanes has talked about <laughs> this. Um, like, fundamentally, what do we think? Actually, the reason why I have something to say about this is because yun nga, it's so popular. Uh, this is one of... The examples that I use when I do fundamental analysis seminars. Because, ayan, biglang nakinig lahat ng tao, di ba? So, They're asking, so, April, anong tip mo so sa yeah. now? Hindi, kasi um, this one, I think the reason why people are excited about it is because it's a potential third telco player. But, you know, realistically speaking, uh, market cap is 14 billion. Net income last year, 6.8 million. Okay, so... According to the terms of reference of the government, if you want to be a third telco, you need 40 billion in capex for the next five years committed. So I don't think, you know, if you are earning 7 million a year, you can afford to do that. It's going to be uh, very difficult. And in fact, um, dapat nga bentahin nyo pa yan kung nanalo siya ng third telco license. Eh? Because I think it's going to be difficult for the third telco when it comes in. It's not going to make money in the first how many years. Um, it's going to be very difficult for the third telco. So, yeah, it's a very speculative play, I think. All right. Uh, may I? I'll just say something. Yeah? Okay. Again, as a standard process, if you guys are going to go after speculative stocks, okay, uh, typical of what I showed you earlier, normally uh, when these rumors or news about the stock come in, you will see the first surge. It's very normal because everybody gets excited about the news and that there could be a potential change into the company. But now, taking what April just said, but remember, it takes time for that reality to generate the revenue and earnings. Okay, so if that's going to re require transition time of two or three years along the way, okay, so once you get the shoot up and they announce whoever wins, okay, execution time, how long will it take you to generate money? What do you think will happen to their stock price in that period? Go up? Worse. Right? So pre please prepare yourself. So I know some of you go, oh my God, third telco, third telco. You might be there for a while. So just, be, just know what you're doing. So if you, if you feel you're going to do that for long term, I guess you can take your chance in it. But I would rather, if you're a trader, trade the speculation. The minute that ends, you get your sell triggers, get out first, and wait for the fundamentals to back you up because that may take a period of time before it happens. Okay. Next one. Sir, I think see April already covered this. Okay, so Ayala Corporation has actually done well, at least with this recovery. At least it's managed to rally back to the previous high it made. That's also a good sign. So this is one of those that I think might, after the reaction, might just consolidate this way. More likely, may not come all the way back down to the blue area. So this one probably tighten up a pattern along the way. Maybe, I hope, flat. Another flat consolidation and eventually try to work it up later. So I think this one you can hold or, or buy it into some dips into support. Okay. Next one, sir, one is? Uh, Ayala Land, not as nice as Ayala Core, but coming along the same path. Uh, I hope it can rally all the way up to the, where that red horizontal line is. But if it cannot, then I would also anticipate that this will probably, this can still do a double test, unfortunately. And I'm also like that with most properties because the threat of uh, interest rates is still there. So you may get a whip back here. So not so aggressive. Always buy this on the dips or in the basing out uh, conditions and not into that rush that you're seeing that you see today. Okay. Metro Bank. Okay. So, <laughs> well, 
Again, it's made a rally. It's very cheap, as April says, but the technicals are not as strong as BDO, not as strong as BPI, not as strong as Security Bank. Um, the others seem to be stronger. So I think it, it went through a major sellout in terms of foreign exit funds, right? So I, I think it might take some time because if you were able to buy all those shares at this low and it goes up maybe 3 or 5%, those guys, I think, would be happy enough to take some profits and wait for a pullback. Uh, for for the movement in Metro Bank. I think more intensification will come after the downtrend line is broken. All right. SEC, Sir Juanes. All right, Semi, uh, Semi Rada shows a clear reversal uh, uh, con to condition already. Uh, but if you notice, I've drawn an upward channel. We hit the high end of that channel, so wait for prices to come back towards the blue line. That might be a better entry for Semi Rada. But at least the trend reversal is clear to me. All right, so that's all we have uh, time for the top 10 stocks. Now let's move on to the Q&A. So if you have any questions, just log into your Slido accounts and uh, make sure you answer the questions. Don't worry because we will be capturing all your questions in Slido and we will announce when the answers will be available to your individual questions. So you can also uh, refer to, to our answers in the app itself once we get back home. Okay, so uh, are there any questions from our uh, audience? So. Uh, Questions that you want to ask directly to uh, our distinguished uh, panel. So here we are in the Slido app. First, uh, what has more effect, the U.S. economic growth or the Fed rate in terms of uh, relating to our stock market? April? It seems like people are more focused on the Fed rate. The Fed rate, yes. Yeah, right, right now rather than the um, U.S. economic growth. So, for example, the, the U.S. dollar kasi diba strengthened um, in response to uh, Fed rate, the Fed rate cycle. So I think people are more focused on that rather than um, U.S. economic growth. Yes. All right. We have another question. Okay. Do you think that the U.S.-China trade war will affect the Fed decision to raise rates further and how? Yeah, yeah. Um, th there really are a lot of moving parts as far as the uh, Fed rate hike decision is concerned. Um, you know, if I mean, it's not because like a while ago, what's more important, economic growth or the Fed rate hike cycle? But then again, uh, may pag circular reference yan eh. If economic growth is not very strong, then you will not see the Fed being as aggressive in raising rates. So I guess the, what people are waiting for is to see whether the trade war will hurt the economy. If uh, the U.S. economy will not be hurt anyway, mm -hmm. uh, even with the, the trade war, then the, the Fed may, will most likely continue to raise rates because at this stage, the reason why the Fed is quite aggressive in raising raise, rates is because it needs room to cut rates when the economy turns. So we're now seeing a normalization cycle. Um, yun yung kinatatakutan nila eh, na if they are not able to increase it fast enough and high enough, when the next economic downturn turn comes about, yeah, they will not be able to respond to it. You know, mawawalan sila ng isang yeah. I think this a normalization alone, there's enough pressure for them to hike the rates. From Mr. Vincent, if oil and food, primarily rice, are the primary drivers of increase in inflation, is it necessary for the BSP to increase the rates? Oh yeah, um, a while ago kasi, di ba, I showed you also core inflation, okay, which trips out, talagang synerge ko yan, is rice and oil part of core inflation? And it is not. So apparently, although oil and rice had a major impact on inflation, there were other factors that were involved that led to higher prices. So talagang, yun lang, the businesses feel like the economy is strong enough such that they can pass on the you know, price increases, uh, higher costs. Yun lang, yun talagang may second round effects. So, in that respect, the BSP really has to be more aggressive. In fact, um, 
it's we are more happy that the BSP is aggressive. Because remember, during the start of the year, they delayed increasing rates. Um, what happened? Diba? Mas malaki yung binaba ng market. Tapos yung secondary rates, ang laki ng tinaas. Due to concerns that inflation would go out of control. And if you read the papers, watch the news, you will hear a lot of foreign investors saying that the BSP is behind the curve. Diba? Um, they need to be more aggressive, take more action. So, ganun ang nagiging reaction ng foreign investors. And you've already mentioned how you're so worried about foreign investors selling out of the Philippines. And that's one of the reasons why they are um, selling out is because they're worried that inflation will take longer than, you know, to address as a problem. So, for us, it's good that the BSP is being more aggressive in addressing the issue. Okay. You have any more questions, guys? From the audience, in the microphones, there are uh, around four. Oh, there's another question from uh, Mr. Felipe. What are your insights on SSI, considering its recent development and licensing agreement with Shake Shack? Um, I think it's positive. <laughs> well, at least I know I'm going to go to Shake Shack <laughs> when it opens. Um, but that said, though, um, that's only one of the many brands that it has. So, so marami pa ng iba. So, at least that, that's one positive, you know, for the stock. Um, right now, I think people are concerned as to whether, you know, they can grow their profits sustainably because they, the, the, the the story about SSI is they overexpanded a bit, and you know now they're trying to um, recover. Okay, keep those questions flowing in to the Slido app, or you can use our microphones. Okay, what is your outlook for GT Cap from Miss Queenie? Thanks. Okay, um, GT Cap. I think valuations are already attractive. The problem is. Um, earlier on, we talked about Catalyst. There seems to be none yet at as of this stage because um, ang nangyari kasi last year because people were anticipating higher excise taxes on automobiles. Nang front load, lahat ng tao bumili ng kotse last year. So this year, uh, car sales are down. Secondly, the company is affected by higher uh, or the weaker peso because, of course, automobiles are imported. So it's being hurt um, from that respect. So maybe next year will be better for the company, but this year, probably not. Okay. What's your take on CLI? Cebulan Master, no? Cebulan C CLI, Masters. Cebu, yeah. Okay, fundamentally, wala namang problema dito. Uh, earnings are very strong, valuations are very cheap, um, uh, very good dividend yield. Um, the problem is uh, when you have blue chips trading at more attractive valuations compared to small caps, uh, oo, mas pinaprioritize ang blue chips. But that said, um, you know, small caps will have their day as well in the sun. So I think this is a stock that you can hold on to. At least you get some dividends. Okay. From it's it. also making a pretty decent pattern now. So there, there seems to be some accumulation going on for CLI. So I, I don't think it'll take too long to, to generate some act activity. All right. You can also vote for the questions you like, huh? Or directly engage the microphones. All right, from... Uh, uh, who are there was a positive funda recommendation on Maxis. What is your technical outlook? Well, Maxis looks like it, it's gone through a very sharp decline and uh, it's just trying to be able to build up a much bigger base for, for its reversal. There, there, there has been some signs of it already. So, yeah, I think you probably see some recovery gra gradually over time for, for Max after it's very, very, very sharp decline for, for the stock. So it looks like the worst is over for Max. What is the prognosis on Wilcon, both fundamentally, inflation risk, and technically, uh, near all-time high? Okay, fundamentally, parang okay naman. Um, I think it's not yet 
we're not yet seeing the impact of inflation. We're not yet that clear um, about that. Um, one of the reasons why this stock did very well since the IPO was um, we were surprised with how strong the margins were uh, for this issue. So no una kala namin ng IPO mahal. Yun pala, the margins would surprise positively. Uh, profits were stronger than expected, leading to the strong share price performance. No, so so far, so far so good. Um, we don't have a coverage yet, but we're monitoring the earnings and they've they've done well so far. On the technical front, I think Wilcon has softened. And what I mean by that is, while the rest of the market was actually going through a major correction, Wilcon was holding its pattern quite strongly. And just recently, uh, roughly at the time Jollibee started to break down, Wilcon cracked an important level of support and took, an, took everything a notch lower. And so what I think it's going to have to do is it might have to build a wider consolidation base. Um, if you had asked me that question maybe two or three months ago, it still looked good. But now I think it softened its stand, so I would anticipate more corrective time because people who bought in the higher end, some of them are, are unloading some, and I think that's going to output a, a wider consolidation base for Wilcon. Okay. All right. Uh, there was an opinion from NEDA chief that the shift to our federalism will negatively impact our economy. What's your thoughts on this planned charter change? Interesting. A very difficult question, actually. <laughs> uh, April, if you can answer that, you'll be the next speaker of the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I can answer with something, not the... Uh, <laughs> it's, well, the argument kasi, you know, according to mga speakers that I've listened to in mga seminars, Kasi yung ibang federalism, hindi naman siya okay, sabi nila. Kasi, um, so this means that they will have to def depend on their own, but, you know, um, you have some small, I guess, small cities that also don't generate a lot of revenue. So, paano na sila, di ba? So, right now, kasi, although, of course, you know, um, the allocation of the funds, siguro yun ang issue nila, then, of course, say in the south they want independence and of course um, then you have some polit you know political analysts are saying that not all federalist economies are actually successful because if you look at maybe mga south africa yung mga african examples magulo sila diba so it's a mixed bag it's not 100% perfect i suppose um, although you also have some that work, like the U.S. or Germany, so I guess, voila, nobody knows. Right, at least in the research that I've uh, uh, encountered. Edmund, I think, Sorry. I think a bigger point or context here. I mean, I, I think it might take few years to answer positively or negatively to this question. Uh, but the big concern we have is th this question of uncertainty. And this is what's taking its toll onto our market. Because if you're about to change your political system, right, you're changing a political system to, to the end, we're not sure, right? You may have, oh, it'll be good, the distribution of wealth will be much better. The other camp will say, yep, it could promote warlordism because each guy will have his own kingdom now across the Philippines, and it'll be harder for, for people to, say, get money from the central government now to, to I mean, there's a lot of things that are taking place, but that uncertainty is, may, might be what might keep people at bay. And if I think if, if once a thing is promulgated and it takes two to three years to, to lay out uh, appropriately, um, we're going to be in limbo you know, for, for a while until, until we know how these things work out. So um, it'd be nice to have a bit more certainty sooner, but until, of course, Philippine politics takes time. Uh, sometimes it's quick, and like I said, speakers change fast nowadays. But uh, I think that period of uncertainty is why maybe our market decided to pull back faster than usual. Right? Because why would somebody want to put a big stake in your market when you're about to change something in a very big way? What's your outlook for DD? May winky face pa. <laughs> yeah. Uh, What's that, daredevil? <laughs> So, actually, nabawasan na ngayong mga tanong dyan. <laughs> diba dati, consistently? People Part are, ng top 10 yan dahil Yeah, it's always um, consistently. Um, but, well, 
again, um, valuation wise, we feel like tignan yung market cap. I think it's the same as Robinson's land, but uh, you know the earnings. Well, they're saying they're gonna earn that amount. Uh, whereas si Robinsons, kinikita na niya yung earnings ni Double Dragon, pero yung valuation ni Double Dragon. Future pa, future earnings. Um, which we don't know yet if it's really gonna materialize. Um, and right now, it's still on the heavy CapEx stage. Pero if you think about the high interest rate environment, ah, Double Dragon is actually vulnerable because it's a highly leveraged company. What if the profits don't materialize the way they want it to be, um, then yeah, then they have so much debts, of course, which increase their cost. So for me, uh, it's it's still kind of expensive. It's not a safe bet at this stage. I'd rather buy the other property companies. All right, thanks. Another question from our audience. There are mics, ah. Huh? lang gusto mag microphone yun. Okay, where do you think the foreign flows are headed from? Um, Cassie Reyes. There's Back been the some States. improvement. There's been some improvement, but maybe not as much as what we wanted to see. And uh, again, the 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 drive of more catalyst, I think, is going to be something that people are watching out for. And uh, you know, like for example, people are watching the Sona to see if they could pick up anything new coming from the statements, and or much of it was something that was expected. And so now the, the delivery of the catalyst might be external because we're waiting for uh, reactions from the dollar, from interest rates abroad, and maybe even here, and how the impact would be. So I, I think the flows might be neutral. And uh, if we're talking about at least two to the next six months, you'll probably get quite a bit of a jumpy movement into the flows. Uh, but until things are a bit more substantial or maybe valuations are just truly so attractive already, I don't think you'll get a, a very, very big amount of foreign flows coming in. I think it'll be more graduated. CLC's price has been badly beaten since IPO date. Do you think it can still recover within the next 12 months? Mr. Felipe. I think one of the factors also hurting uh, CLC is rising oil price because they are heavily, uh, you know, one of the major costs is oil. So, Siguro, that's one of the things uh, that you have to take a look at. And, well, when it IPO'd, we felt like it was fully valued anyway. Medyo mahal siya talaga. So, um, I guess, because people were excited about the to-go business. So, you know, they they were willing to pay, um, you know, an expensive valuation. But, of course, general market weakness, rising oil prices. So, it hasn't been good for the company. Will the approval of Train 2 affect the market index? Will it make it higher or lower? Train 2 is more controversial compared to Train 1 because um, they're saying that some of the incentives will be taken out. Um, but I think in general, if you ask the foreign investors, they are more positive on the passage of all uh, train packages because in, ge in general that will allow the government to raise all the revenues that they want to generate um, and allow the government to execute on its aggressive infrastructure plan. So I'm more positive rather than negative but versus train one, I think train two is not as um, exciting. All right. What is your rear-end outlook for MAC, both fundamentally and technically? Well, fundamentally, the, the you know the problem with um, uh, Macro Asia, when we started talking about it last year, it was um, widely ignored stock. Nobody knew anything about it. It was so cheap. And the earnings last year were very strong because it was the first full year um, that I think they did an expansion of one of their, um, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know, yeah, hangers, which allowed them to uh, accept more planes. Plane. Yeah, the larger planes. I don't even remember. Uh, A380 Seata, eh? no, which are higher margin planes to service. But this year, um, when the first quarter came about, 
may ano eh, um, the earnings actually disappointed. They did not come in as people had anticipated. And not to mention valuations are already at more than 20 times PE, so priced in na. And then of course, I'm sure you've all heard rumors about potential M&As and about how this M&A will lead to how much valuation, how expensive, ganun. Eh, problem eh, tagal-tagal na natin naghihintay, wala pa yung M&A, di ba? So, I think, you know, coming from a, from a very low base, now you're already at a very high base with people having very high expectations. It's, in my opinion, more vulnerable to a correction rather than it will go up. Or let's say the M&A really materializes. Baka nga maging sell-on news pa yan eh, kasi, oh, now what, di ba? It's, it's there already. Sir? Well, the technicals seem to be agreeing with that same condition. Right now, it's in, in a reactive state. And uh, I'm waiting for that stage where it goes through a wind down. So, you know, a gradual consolidation phase turning around because I haven't seen it yet. But what's nice is at least the pullback wasn't so extensive. Right? So maybe it's trying to weigh out on the prospects as compared to, uh, of course, the, the poor earnings or the disappointing earnings that it had. But I think wait for it, wait for it to finish its congestion. After that, I think I don't think you've seen the last of that just yet. All right. Due to high inflation and, and depreciating peso, what is the probability of a rate hike in the next August BSP monetary meeting? Will the PSEI be highly affected? Yeah, I think most likely the BSP will be raising rates um, in the August meeting. But that said, I don't think that the market will view this negatively. In fact, I think um, you know it's going to be a neutral event in case the BSP does ra raise rates. Um, it would be a negative uh, event if the BSP does not do anything. But I think um, most likely the BSP will raise rates. All right. What's your take on Meralco, despite the gloomy approval of its PSA? Uh, for Meralco, actually, we don't have any problems despite our not so very positive outlook on power because um, what's affecting the power sector is lower selling price and um, higher costs. But since Meralco is a distribution company, they're not a power generation company, then um, of course it's not affected, which is why the share price is not going down anyway. But then we feel like because it's expensive, the opportunity to make more is not there fundamentally. Right, I guess we have room for one more question. Don't worry, guys. If you have uh, entered your question, it's not uh, entertained here. We'll, we, we will find a way to answer your questions either through the groups or through Slido app itself. All right? Any questions? Last question. I have both. Bloom and MRP in my portfolio at the same time early this year. MRP is lagging about 30 to 35 percent behind. Can you explain? Oh. <laughs> we, we don't work for both companies, by the way. <laughs> Get up. Honestly, you know, I, I never really thought about it. <laughs> well, uh, le maybe we, we should just respond to this. Uh, after we Sige. look at it na lang with, All right. you know. No, we'll I think it. what the, something in context of what April told you earlier, I said if you, if you want to focus on which issues to pick, start with the better one. So if she said that Bloomberry was the leader of the industry, people are watching Bloomberry to move before they even trade the other gaming stocks. So if you're going to be in that context, I mean, uh, what I would have done if he wanted one is I'll put a heavier stake in Bloomberry and a minor stake in the second one right because if you feel you're going to put 50 50 but remember the other one is much much more formidable than the other one you probably get the first response in the first and a follow-through action in the second so if you want to build a portfolio of the same stock uh, same industry just have a very much a minor weight into uh, so that at least the disappointment you know it's not like a too much of a nightmare to you later on all right that's all the time we have for the q a don't worry if you have your questions put in we'll try to answer them and find a way to uh Give them back to you, either through the groups or through the Slido app itself. Now, uh, just a final remarks, uh, our distinguished speakers. Would you like to have uh, some 
some parting comments to our audience today. So let, let's start with you, April. Oh, not yet. That's, si Juan is too, eh. oh, Sorry, si Juan is para. Sir, any... Uh, Okay, so uh, I think um, in, in what we're talking about in summary is that we do anticipate that the market rally uh, was really supposed to come. Um, I do hope that we can reach over, uh, you know, to, to the next levels of resistance, and I'm, I'm anticipating that between the 7680 and we're there right now, maybe all the way up. I hope it can even go to 79. But after that, I'm anticipating you're going to get into a resistance sell-off. And as I anticipate, you'll get a downward movement in prices. Some will retest the low, some will consolidate. Uh, don't let that take you to dismay because that's a normal process as prices try to be able to bottom out. Uh, be watchful of the, aug the August effect, as we pointed out earlier on. And maybe after that, or maybe, maybe worse comes to worse, maybe, maybe at about November, where the second correction normally takes place, you might have the opportunity to have a, uh, a year-end hurrah, uh, at least trying to lift prices off the, the base that you have come from. But like again, as, as we like to remain uh, excited about the market, it takes time to regenerate the catalyst for growth. And because of that, we will go through a consolidation phase. So buy it on the way down, closer to support, and don't be too eager to jump too much when prices are just jumping up like this, because it's not a runaway market that we're going to get involved with. April? Yeah, I guess, um, you know, one of the most important key takeaways of today is I think um, both Juanes and I agree is, you know, we've seen the bottom. But I guess the question right now, the more important question is, are we going to be seeing a V-shaped rally or are we going to see an L-shaped rally? Um, I think it's more of an L-shaped rally, but that said, since we've already seen the bottom, valuation trumps everything and, um, you know, you should take this opportunity to accumulate stocks. Um, eventually, it will recover. All right, so thank you very much. Um, again, uh, for those of you who weren't able to catch this outlook, we will have a rerun on August 1 at around 4 p.m. We can use the Slido app to again participate as the moderators will be there to answer your questions. But before we move on, before we end this program, I'd like to uh, talk more about uh, our groups that we have in Facebook. So as our chairman has uh, more, most often said in his talks, that you know, we all have our own different ways of viewing things. And fortunately, we all have a blind side. And one way to cure that blind side is to join a group of like-minded individuals and help, uh, in order to help you, uh, you know, uh, make your investing decision. So for uh, our traders, we have COL Training to Alpha. Uh, get uh, real-life updates, uh, daily updates from our chief technical analyst as well as from our partners in Kalum who gives, uh, you know, their updates uh, twice a week. We also have a huge library of uh, lessons. If you want to learn how to trade, learn how to do it better, we have an online version of the technical analysis seminar, as well as uh, some seminars on position trading and momentum trading. You can also ask questions, try to interact with our experts, and they will answer you as soon as possible. Unfortunately, you can't chat with their with our uh, avatar, si Jane. So, if you're not your friend, you can't chat with her, but uh, she, she'll, she'll try to answer you when uh, you ask her any question. So to join, you can just search COL Trading to Alpha in Facebook and click join and we will approve your uh, application if you are a premium client. Another group that we uh, like to uh, talk to you guys about is our COL Wealth Builders. So this, you, you can get the daily market updates as well as company news. So uh, you are uh, always at, um, on the edge of things. Get information, mutual funds, cost averaging, and long-term investing. Uh, if you're not a trader, here's the site for you. It also shows uh, some, uh, some uh, yung April's calling the shots are also here. So if it uh, turns up in your notification, then uh, you can also join this group. Uh, to join, uh, click uh, CEO Premium Wealth Builders, search it in Facebook and click to join. All right, so sana we can uh, find you there. All right, that's all the time we have for now. Again, thank you very much for joining us this morning and have a great day ahead. Thank you.